We did. Bye. Okay. Yay. Well, we're still going to talk about the Turner diagram first. Um, it's a three-sided diagram, also known as a triangle, and each axis is 100% of something. And so you're going to see this for, for uh, igneous rocks, you're going to see it for sedimentary rocks, you're going to see it for soils. And I just wanted to sort of cue you in so you know what's going on. So for instance, with sedimentary rocks, this would be quartz, silicon dioxide. This would be feldspar, which is another mineral. And this would be either rock fragments or something else. And it's, we'll, we'll see in a little bit. And if you're up here, the rock type would be called a quartz aronite, which means it's 100% quartz sand. And we'll see proto quartz aronite tomorrow at, at the creek. And we'll, we'll play with it a little bit. Um, and then if you have this, you have a, an arcos, which is 100% Feldspar, and um, I'm having a hard time remembering what the third one is. But maybe we'll see it on the on the list. Okay, so do I have to, to advance this? Do we have a, a clicker? And by the way, every time I walk by there, I get blinded, so I don't actually know where you guys are. So if I'm if I'm lecturing in the wrong direction, I'm gonna... yeah, that's. Here we go. Here, just for just for giggles and grins, we're gonna pass this around. This is my rock guard most of the time, so it's a little bit easier. We'll start on this side this time. So the cool thing about that is so there's two ways of measuring the age of the earth. One is an absolute using absolute time, using radioactive decay to determine the age of the earth. And I could go into gory detail on any one of these subjects, but we only have about two hours, an hour and a half, um, <laughs> to do it. So we're going to skim off the top. And if there are other topics or topics that I've spoken about today that you're interested in, raise your hand. Maybe we can go into a little more, elaborate a little bit more. So, um, so there's two ways. One is, is uh, absolute age dating, where you use radiometric decay. So like, for instance, uranium. Uranium decays to lead. So if you look at a rock that had 100% uranium in it a billion years ago, it might have 50% uranium and 50% lead. And that gives you an idea that half the, half the uh, uranium decayed, so it's 500 million years old. And that's sort of a short version of how you do that. The other way to determine the age is relative dating. <coughs> Relative dating sounds like something you do with your sister, but it isn't. Uh, uh, I'm here all day, folks. I'm here all day. Advancing? It's not clicking? I'll, I'll go over there and push the button. You sure you want me to stand here and you can tell me next slide? Sure. I'm good at that. That'll work. That'll work? Okay. <laughs> so anecdote number one, since we talked about that, when I was at UC Davis, a very famous uh, paleontologist, the person who studied uh, ancient plants, came to give a lecture. And I don't know if you've ever been through a lecture on ancient plants, but after the first five minutes or so, it's really, really sort of sleep inducing. <laughs> it's not the most exciting one. Not as bad as Raymond Gangloff, who talked about archaeosciatic. We get into that one later. Oof. Anyway. So Axelrod, this Professor Axelrod, he was about 85 years old at the time, and he would lecture, and he had a, um, a ruler. He'd walk over to a table, and when he wanted to advance the next slide, he'd slam it down. Nobody fell asleep during his lecture. <laughs> Nobody really did. Anyway, that was anecdote, that's anecdote number one. We can talk about Raymond Gangloff at some other time, but that will really put you to sleep. OK. So what is geology? We talked about the name of the name. We talked about how old it is. Somebody said 4.6 billion years. So how much is a billion? Did I? Yeah, go to the previous slide. So just to give you an idea of how much a billion is, what were we doing a thousand seconds ago? Well, an hour is 3,600 seconds. So a thousand seconds ago, we were 
almost here. So we were here. So in a day, there's 86,000 seconds. In a million seconds is, a, is a 11 days. And a billion seconds is 31 years. So it gives you an idea. I can also go into the, you know, how many dollars end to end it would take to get to, uh, um, in order to get to them from the earth to the moon, it's, it's about $3 billion. So we, that wouldn't even register on our national debt. Okay, Earth Compass, just in the next, next slide. Oh, you're doing it. You're not Carolyn. That's right. <laughs> but you're related to her somehow. <laughs> okay, so the Earth is made up of, of layers, and the layers are the inner core, the outer core, the mantle, and the crust. And the crust is broken down into the lithosphere and asthenosphere. Don't need to remember any of these names. Well, I can tell you the most important ones are the fact that the doesn't look like it's spelled correctly. The inner okay. anyway, um, the inner core is solid, the outer core is liquid. And the reason that that's important is there's a lag between the rotation of the two and creates a dynamo effect, which makes the magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field. Without the Earth's magnetic, am I <coughs> not loud enough again? Without the Earth's magnetic field it would be very difficult for life to exist on Earth because there's a lot of energetic particles that come through and it would cause a lot of mutations. Maybe we'd be much more advanced. We'd each have two heads, something like that, but it, would, it probably wouldn't end up really good. And life probably would not have been able to venture out onto land. It probably would have stayed underwater because that's another way of uh, protecting you from radiation is, is going into a bunch of water. Ah, and the great source my so the mantle is actually a, a putty-like liquid, and it is um, churning continuously, taking the heat from the uh, core, which is where all that potassium 40 is, and transferring it out into the lithosphere and asthenosphere, where it comes out as igneous rocks. Next slide. Whoa. So... Once again, this looks like a, um, almost like an Easter egg or something like that, where you have the chocolate in the center and the, uh, over the, the, the cream in the center of the chocolate. I'm not a Christian, so I don't know about these Easter egg things. Um, so the, uh, yeah, so it looks, does it look like an Easter egg, sort of? Okay. It's not over. You know, what else? What else is there? <laughs> ah, there we go. That's much better. Oh. Ah, there we go. I'm going to brighten it up because it's, it's very light. Oh, it's all over bright. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. By the way, if you ever want to see cool rocks and you're just sort of in the middle of nowhere and you don't know where to go, go to a railroad bed. The, uh, the railroad bed is made out of, um, of rocks that are called ballast. And the ballast is used to prevent the, the cars, the, the rock back and forth. And that ballast is heavy enough that it keeps them from falling over. And you find all really, really cool different kinds of rocks. As a matter of fact, I just happen to have, I know you're very surprised about this, <laughs> but I just happen to have a bag somewhere in here. I stole these from the Union Pacific Railroad. <laughs> Something <laughs> Pacific Railroad. It wasn't what? It wasn't in Ohio, was it? No. <laughs> no. Okay, question for you guys. Is that too early? No. No, that was good. No, I um, so I have in here, I've got a bunch of different kinds of rocks. Um, we'll look at these later, I think, but you will have to take them away or you can go around, but it's kind of dark in here right now. Um, this is full of different kinds of igneous rocks. So what's really cool is it's got, I've got some basalt in here a little bit. I've got a rhyolite, which is an extrusive, well, let's not talk about that just yet. <laughs> 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 okay, 
Okay, let's go to the next slide. Plate tectonics. What is plate tectonics? Anyone know? Okay, what's plate tectonics? Well, the Earth's outer crust has these what they call plates, and they're constantly moving. And some of them are going over, some are going under, some are colliding. Okay, that's it. She's going to do the rest of the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> that was very good. Yep. So plate tectonics, as, as Kate pointed out, is the, and I know all of your names, right? <laughs> Um, is the study of the interaction of those plates on the surface and the, where, where the plates are coming together to create mountains, where they're pulling apart to create ocean basins. So how did people search will start getting an idea that this happened? I mean, you had measurements of the, the internal heat of the earth, and that was very confusing because at the time they didn't know anything about radioactive decay, and where that heat came from. And there was a guy named Alfred Wegener who um, was actually a glaciologist. He studied glaciers. And he was very perplexed about the fit of the continents, how North and South America seemed to, if you could push them back together again, they would fit. And he said, hey, I think that there's this thing called continental drift. I think that the Earth, uh, these plates, these, these continental masses, are moving back and forth. And then they started off as a gigantic continent of Pangaea, and they broke apart, and now they're all going away from each other. Maybe there's a, a hollow center to the Earth, even. Um, so people looked at that, and they said, Al, are you crazy? <laughs> push, push South America and North, back, North, North, North America back together again. They don't fit perfectly. They kind of fit. It's just a coincidence. And besides, uh, we just uh, laid a bunch of cable down between New York and London from, uh, for uh, telephone cable, and we found that there's a giant mountain range underwater between in the Atlantic between New York and London. How the heck are these continents going to go riding over the top of these, um, these mountain ranges in there? It's just not going to happen. It can't happen. Hmm. And Alfred said, I don't know about the, the fit is pretty good, though, and if you look at the continental shelf, so the water that's next to the continent and it's inundated, it's got un underwater, but it's shallow water. If you use that, the fit is a lot better. Okay, we'll, we'll concede that, but what about that mountain range and all this other stuff? And he says, well, there's another thing. Next slide. Is fossil evidence. And fossils are the coolest thing in the world because they tell you so much stuff. I mean, I know for a fact that 130 million years ago, there were poopy little shrimps. <laughs> and I know even further ago that there were algae that would grow near the coast, and every night um, they would get covered with sediment, and every day they'd grow through that sediment, making layer upon layer, and these things are called stromatolites. And this particular one is from the Belt Supergroup. It's 1.4 billion years old. Wow. Right? And I know that because of absolute age. So Alfred Wagner looks at this and he says, hold on a second. There's uh, Lysposaurus, which is a mammal-like reptile, this guy up here. And you find him in India and in Australia and North and South America in the, the southern parts. And not only that, but if you look at the rocks that are associated with it, there's glaciers, ancient glaciers, because there are, he was a glaciologist, he know what the sediments look like that are pushed by glaciers. There's evidence of glaciers in South America and Africa where they fit together. Not only that, but there's a plant called, a seed fern called Glossopterus, which was found in Antarctica and Australia and Africa and South America. And there was also a little reptile, swimming reptile, freshwater, so we couldn't go across the oceans, called Mesosaurus, which is this little guy down in here, freshwater reptile. And they were all over the place too. And they perfectly matched where this came together. Not only that, but their minerals, there were um, deposits of gold that came off the African continent 
right over here. And lo and behold, if you push it back, people started looking for the plaster deposits, the sedimentary deposits of gold in ancient riverbeds there, and they found it. And it's got the same kind of uh, chemistry as that, the gold from Africa. All gold's not exactly the same. So we had all this information. It was great, but people still didn't believe them until, and I don't have a uh, slide for this, until after World War II, um, there were uh, some research bodies that bought old minesweepers from World War II. Does everybody know what a minesweeper is? Yeah. Coffee's done. Thank you. Okay, guys, coffee, time, time for a break, right? Um, and so, oh yeah, so the, so the minesweepers had magnetometers, things that measure magnetic field. And they found out that as you went across the Atlantic, there were areas where there was positive magnetic anomalies and areas where there were negative ma uh, magnetic anomalies. And it went back and forth. And if they, if they um, went back and forth on the boat very carefully, they found out that they had these stripes of positive magnetic fields. And they realized that this was the remnant magnetism of basalt which is a, an igneous rock, an extrusive rock, a volcanic rock, that came up in the middle of the ocean and froze with that magnetic field and realized, and this happened on the, on the continents, that if you looked at igneous rocks that froze up on the surface, that they had the remnant magnetism of a magnetic field on the Earth that was either um, the same as it is today, or reversed. So when the magnetic field reversed, it froze into those rocks. And this is the, the magnetic striping, which made them realize that those mountain ranges in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean were mountain ranges because they're volcanoes. And they're higher because igneous rocks, when they come out, they're hot, and hot stuff expands. And as it cools, it contracts. And that's why you have the ocean basin. Okay. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. OK, next slide. So plate tectonics, I just have a little, little. Uh, by the way, I put in people's uh, websites, so if anybody wants to find this stuff, I can, I can get you that. I don't want to share my, um, my slides because um, I got, you, you have permission to use stuff for educational purposes internally, but you shouldn't share. I, I try not. Because we're recording this. I'm going to be putting it on YouTube. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. It's fine. I've got I've got the where where I borrowed it. I've got the Perfect. URLs. <laughs> I'll see you guys. <laughs> Don't worry. Okay. So for those of you who can't, who only see this, his slides are very colorful. Mm -hmm. So the the blue of the ocean is a beautiful blue. The sky is a beautiful blue. And I, you know, this is probably. Older than me. So, so it's like 30. We're going we're to definitely take that into consideration. Page 239 of our textbook has very close to the same awesome. image. Okay, for those of you at home who might not have heard, page 239 has this close to the same, so you get all the colorfulness of it. <coughs> Onto the uh, slides there. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, so this just shows you the, the nature of plate tectonics. And what happens is the um, mantle is trying to, is convecting the hot liquid. And as it gets to an area, it tries to go up, it cools off, and then sort of starts to, to move away, creating these, uh, these hot spots. And um, there are places where, as they get cooler, they hit into continental crust. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I don't have to get But she'll be able to use that. So you don't have to get blinded. Okay. So then. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I've, I've just been diagnosed with essential tremor. So yeah. I put my, my index finger, it goes a little crazy. So 
Anyway, um, so as it cools, it gets heavier, and it's, as it goes down, it's called subduction. As it goes down, it warms up again, and you get um, either igneous intrusive rocks, meaning rocks mm -hmm. that got up near the surface but didn't get to the surface, and extrusive rocks, which are like volcanic rocks. So this whole cycle, imagine this is coming down like a conveyor belt, and it comes down, warms back up again, and comes back up through. So the, the earth is dynamic and is constantly replenishing itself. Okay, next slide. So structural geology. So I'm just going through all the, the highlights of geology. This is a, a one semester class, done in two hours. Which is why when Carolyn said, would you do this in one hour? I said, sure, why not? I live life, day, life dangerously. As you can tell by the way I was seeing this. Okay, so um, when we sort of zoom back down into the smaller scale, we can talk about different features of rocks. And one of the features that I want to talk about is, is called geological structures. So um, igneous rocks are deposited either internally or on the surface. Sedimentary rocks are formed by um, uh, the igneous metamorphic sedimentary rocks being eroded and redeposited, and then they get uh, uh, very deeply, they get lithified, they become solid, um, and then they get deformed by those. Can you go back one? They get deformed by these processes that happen in here. And so you can get, okay, next slide. So you get deformate, deformation of the rocks, and the deformation can either be brittle, in which case you see a break in the rocks, or ductile, in which case you see the rocks folding. And there are some places where you have kind of both. There's a, uh, an area in central Washington state called Rattlesnake Ridge, and the Columbia River flood basalts are actually being, being um, bent instead of broken by it because of weird tectonic influences, this thing called cataclysis, where the rock is being sort of crushed internally, but they have these giant folds that are formed at a large scale. <clears throat> so next slide. Oh, no, that one's out of, out of uh, position. Oh, well, I'm, I'm leaving. <clears throat> okay, so um, can you go to the previous slide? We'll continue talking about this. And um, so you've got brittle deformation. And so when the rocks are being pushed together, they break. Um, and the next slide. Next slide. <sighs> Heavy sigh. I, I apologize, folks. Some of these slides are out of, out of position. Um, Let's let's go back. Let's 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 stay here for a bit, and then we'll go back to the structure thing when the other structure slides come back up. They rear their ugly heads. Um, so this is the rock cycle. This is just a close-in view of how the rocks rocks are um, are renewed on the on the surface of the earth. One of the things that you got to understand is the earth is old, but it's not. It's very dynamic, and it's very young. If you go to Iceland, if you go to the Hawaiian Islands, if you go to Anak Krakatau in, in um, Indonesia, these are places where the rock is younger than you are. You pick up a piece of, of basalt or um, rhyolite or some other igneous extrusive rock, some other volcanic rock, if it's not too hot, it's probably younger than you are. Or it could be just a few thousands of years old. But some of it can be really old. The oldest rocks that have ever been dated are about 3.8 billion years. There are minerals or pieces of other rocks in those rocks that are older, you know, to about 4 billion years old. But those rocks very often are found in places where there's active glaciation um, or, or just erosion. And so those rocks are being turned into young rocks. It's very, very exciting. So tomorrow, when we're at Spring Creek, we're seeing the other end of that spectrum. So 
Um, just looking at the rock cycle again, you have uplift. I'm scared of this thing. You have uplift, and then once it up, gets uplifted, it gets eroded, goes uh, sediment, makes its way down into the uh, into the either lake or the ocean, gets buried successively by subduction or abduction or, or of the uh, of its continents. Eventually, gets turned into a mountain, and the cycle continues. So this is a small version of the pipe tectonic view that you're seeing. Okay, next slide. <laughs> oh, don't. Oh. I, I left that one in. Yeah, sorry about that. That's for, that's for a different lecture. Should I go to the next slide? Yeah, go to the next slide. Oh, okay. So as we were talking about this, there's three rock types. Ignorant, metaphoric, and metaphoric. Um, igneous, and igneous has been broken down into two different kinds. So intrusive or rocks that always, they're, they're like your neighbors. They go over to, the, to your fence and ask you what you're doing. <laughs> they're very intrusive. Um, no, they're, they're um, in place deep under or underground. It's got to be at least tens of kilometers deep. Otherwise, it cools so fast that it, it doesn't really look like an, an intrusive rock. Uh, metamorphic rocks. And metamorphic rocks are usually, there's two, two characteristics for metamorphic rocks. One is that they're being chemically altered without melting. So it's, it's a, um, uh, a process called metasomatism. The other is that they have a tendency of being deformed plastically, so you get folds in them, either, either anti-clinal folds or synclinal folds, which we'll talk about later. And then um, there's the, the range of the mountain building associated metamorphic rocks are at the lowest level are slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss. And um, if we have more time, I'd go into more gory detail, and we could later if you want to. Okay, and then sedimentary rocks, and sedimentary rocks are formed by the, the weathering and erosion of pre existing rocks. And so that could be uh, either chemically or physically. And so they're broken down into size fragments. So the conglomerates are the um, coarsest, and then sandstone and mudstone. And mudstone can be broken down into pure mudstones or, or clays. And then carbonates are another thing unto itself. That's, that's actually my expertise. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring around a couple of, um, couple of sediment things here. This is a sand. And you are more than welcome to open this and feel it. So sand is going to feel gritty. Sand, you should be able to see the ind individual grains with the naked eye or with the hand lens. And I like this collection of just out here. <laughs> okay, so silt is a little finer. You can't see the individual particles with, particles with the naked eye, but it does feel a little gritty. And then uh, clay, so mud rocks, this one I rehydrated yesterday. If you, um, oh, glasses, they're not there anymore. Um, you'll see what looks like a little snail in there. One of the other folks who I, when I was lecturing on soils, made a little rope out of it. This is how you can tell it's a clay. If you have a mud-sized particles, it's going to feel smooth to the touch, mostly. There may be a little bit of um, uh, grittiness in it because it's not a pure clay. But if you roll it out into a rope and you roll it, it doesn't crack. And that's the way to tell you that it's clay. So let's go to the back. Okay, and then I do have one other. This is gravel. And one of the things about sedimentary rocks is they're very full of minerals. 
I'm a professional. Don't do this at home. <laughs> and you're more than welcome to try to talk. <laughs> oh my goodness. And it's really funny. Yesterday I was over at the Lake Creek Preserve. And there was an area that had these really fine gravels. It looked almost identical. <laughs> and I thought, should I get some of that? And mix it in? And I thought, no, that's just. <laughs> oh. So we did a walk through Hammond Creek in Huntsville the other day. And we thought there was like a big uh, layer of st stones. And they looked pretty smooth. And there were some chunkier pieces. And so we picked them up. But they cracked. And they really looked more like clay. They look like stone. I got pictures of it. I think that's what mudstone maybe looks like. Yeah, so um, sometimes if you're looking at um, sand sized particles, <clears throat> clay is much lighter than sand. So if the clay is broken into pieces, if, it's, if it had dried, sometimes you're in a place where the, where the uh, mud dries, you get mud cracks. And then the mud cracks break into smaller pieces, they get washed into a creek. And the mud doesn't fall apart so easily because it has, um, it's got some bonds, some, some uh, hydrogen bonds, or van der Waals forces that keep it together. And it will, uh, those big pieces of clay will mix in with the sand and you'll see them um, in the outcrops in like the Cretaceous, you see these, these pieces of clay and you think, well, how did that survive? Well, it, it's able to, to survive for a long time in the creek before it gets deposited. I'm not making a lot of sense. <laughs> well, I guess the, because it carries a charge, I'm assuming. So well, it's, it's just, it keeps it internal. It, it keeps it from breaking apart into the mud time mm -hmm. part. It has to sit for a while. We'll, we will actually see something, I think. We'll see armoring on, uh, on the creek, I think. Okay, next slide. Okay, so, um, the most abundant elements in the earth are iron, sodium, silicon, oxygen. And so in the crust, the uh, in the crust, the most um, oh, have this. Um, abundant minerals are these guys and in the lower crust and mantle it's more like that to sodium. So um, the the crust, the, what we live on is kind of the scum at the top of the earth. <laughs> so as the earth melted, you go through this and stuff, so we'll talk about that. So this is the first time I'm doing this particular lecture. Um, so I'm thinking about what I'm going to do for the next one. So you guys are going to get this. This is the 1.0 version. <laughs> okay, I, I did put it. So the minerals that are associated with these elements are quartz, which is SiO2, feldspars, which is SiO plus sodium, potassium, and calcium, plagioclase and orthoclase. Plagioclase is the calcium or sodium, sodium rich version of Elsewhere. North Clays is the potassium version of it. Amphiboles, which is a um, uh, more iron rich, um, but pretty silica rich as well, um, mineral. And then pyroxenes are the ones that are the most iron rich and the least silica rich. So you, you'll get rocks that have this composition, and there's almost no silica. Very, or, I'm sorry, no, almost no oxygen. Anyway, okay, so the rocks that are, are um, the most common rocks that are found as a result of um, uh, igneous processes are basalt, which is a volcanic rock that's got a lot of iron and magnesium, gabbro, which is the intrusive version of basalt. So if you were to melt gabbro in, a, in an oven, and cool it really quickly, it would look just like basalt. Mm. 
<laughs> You're not writing me out. I appreciate that. Um, this is a vesicular basalt that's from the Columbia River flood basalts, and I collected that in uh, the coast in Oregon. <clears throat> so that'll come around. <clears throat> this is not the ideal um, venue for looking at rocks, but we'll, we'll turn on the lights later and you guys can take a look at stuff. Um, granite or granitoids, um, and I didn't put it in granite like the, the, this is the intrusive version. The extrusive version is called rhyolite. Did I? Yeah. Structural geology. We're back to structure. This is where I had messed up with the, um, the science. Okay, so a couple of pieces of um, marginalia that we need to think about is this is a disruption in the rock. It's called a fault. Um, there are two parts of the, the fault. There's the one that you could, if you excavated it out, you could walk on top. So that would be the foot wall. You can walk on your feet. And then the other side is where you can imagine if you stop right here and you got rid of this stuff from here, you can hang off of that. That's called the hanging wall. So in a normal fall, the hanging wall goes down, the foot wall goes up. In a reverse fall, the hanging wall goes up, the foot wall goes down. So you can imagine for the normal fall, you're pulling apart and pieces are sliding down. For the, for the reverse fall, you're pushing it and pieces are getting sloughed up, up together. So that would happen in a compressional area like um, where you have subduction and things like that. Next slide. So if the rocks are buried deeply enough or they're warm enough, instead of breaking, they bend and they deform plastically. And so, or ductily. And so they create these faults. So here we've got this fault coming through here, or this uh, fold, sorry. And when the fold, you take your hand, come here, everybody, put your hand out, you go like this with your fingers bent. Thank you, Jay. This is a syncline or a syn form. If I go the other way, it's an anticline. Now, anticlines, they're older in the middle and younger on the sides. So you can imagine if I were to cut this off over here, this is the older rock and that's younger and that's younger. Because how do we know that? And I didn't add this into my lecture either because I three hours long. I know. Um, we can tell that because of some of the laws of stratigraphy that I didn't talk, go into. So my specialty is carbonate stratigraphy. Stratigraphy is a study of layers of rock. And so I study the layers and I study how they interact with each other. And there's a few laws that you have with respect to, um, to rocks. One is the law of superposition. And superposition means that the oldest rocks are at the bottom and the oldest rocks are at the top. It makes a lot of sense. Another one is the law of continuity of beds. If I see rock here, and I see the same kind of rock here, I infer that they're continuous, unless they're disrupted by erosion. 
if they're, if they're eroded away, they were continuous until they, they got eroded away. So that's the law of continuity of beds. And the uh, law of relative position is the younger rocks are at the bottom, and the older rocks are at the top. Okay, next slide. Uh, I go into more gory detail. Um, so as I, as I had mentioned earlier, um, rocks are either iron and magnesium rich or silicon and oxygen rich. So mafic means magnesium and ferric or uh, iron bearing minerals. And sialic is coarse uh, silica and aluminum. Oh, I need to put aluminum into that list of the most important elements. Aluminum is one of those. Uh, it's an aluminum silicate. Matt, you should had to call me on this. All right. Okay, so texture. Um, there are intrusive rocks. I put out some of the rocks that I said was a granite, and that's got grains in it that you can see with your naked eye. There's another one that I sent around that's kind of pinkish. You really you might see little holes in it, but there were no no crystals. And so that was um, an extrusive rock, and the one with the, with the grains in it is intrusive. Now, there's, um, if you look at intrusive rocks, you see characteristics of them. One of the things you find is, is this. Does anybody know what that is? And I got a really great sample of some xenoliths, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> it could be, I think it's actually in the shed. The shed is very scary. <laughs> there are rats in the shed. I got cats in my backyard, now I have rats. Uh, um, anyway, xenoliths, xenos, is anybody up on their Greek? Foreign. Alien in, in not like a little green man alien. In like somebody Xenomorph. Who was that? Or xenomorph, alien movie. Yes. <laughs> And then you also see the individual minerals. And you'll see, um, okay, so this is a, a learning moment right now. You walk into somebody's house and they say, I just had my kitchen redone. And they get these granite countertops. You walk over and you look at it and it's black. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> if it's black, it's mafic. If it's mafic, it's not granite. Oh. So what do you do if you're a geologist and you walk in and the person says, I've got this beautiful black granite with these with these reflections that are moonstones? You go, why isn't that nice? <laughs> no, I can't say that. No, no. It's nice, I can't take it for granted. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> So, so me, I do exactly what Kay says. That's a really nice countertop. <laughs> and I'll, I'll often say something like, I especially like the Schiller flash, because the most common dark rock that's used, that's got big crystals in it, that's used as a, uh, a counterstone, it's called a larvakite. The larvakite is from Larvakite, Sweden, and it's got plagioclase feldspar that's called moonstone and it's got this flash to it like a blue bright blue as you're walking by you see these individual crystals blue, or have these blue blue flashes and those are the uh, uh, plagioclase feldspars they're labradorites i'm pretty sure and it's beautiful but it's not a brand <laughs> okay so extrusive also known as volcanic rocks, can often have gases in them. And the gases will cause the rock to expand in little places. And so you've got these vesicles, these holes in it. And very often as the rock cools, the vesicles host water from the water table or something like that, and minerals will precipitate within those. And those minerals are often things like um, calcite, stuff like that that are that, that exciting. But sometimes you have um, these exotic minerals called zeolites, which are formed in there and are really pretty, um, natural light and chalcocyte and all these others. Um, 
And you look at that and you say, well, these are crystals I can see with the naked eye. So it's obviously got to be intrusive, not extrusive. But that's the stuff that's in the holes, in the vesicles. In the main body of the rock, you don't usually see uh, things with crystals, unless you have a xenolith. So as the rock is coming up through the earth, it breaks the rock around it. It's melted, it breaks the rock around it. And it can incorporate those broken pieces, those are the xenoliths. When it gets to the surface, if it's still liquid at the surface, it'll freeze and you'll have these xenoliths of um, rocks that have big crystals within the mass of basalt or lava flow. Okay, that's a long way to go for now. Okay, Aaron, if you're out in, in the West, they have these formations they call hogbacks. Uh -huh. They're tall. And yeah. Obviously, eroded away and left that. Is that something left over from volcanic, or is it just. No, most of those hogbacks are uh, uh, sedimentary rocks, and they're the, the remnants of tectonic action that happened during the Eocene. So these things got folded and then they got eroded and the center of the fold is where the hog bags are. And they, they're almost like razor bags mm -hmm. you come back up and into it. And very commonly at the apex, you'll see a difference in the lithology. You'll see a mudstone on one side and a sandstone on the other. And that sandstone is usually the Dakota sandstone, it's the Lower Cretaceous. And the mudstone is usually the tropical shell or the mango shell. Wow. So just that little bit of description prompted me to understand where she was talking about. So that's the thing is I'm walking all along in some place that's got rocks. My head is firmly looking down. Mine too, so I won't fall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 I got size 14 feet. It's too late for me for that. <laughs> I'm going to fall. As a matter of fact, I'll show you, if you remind me, I'll show you exactly where I face planted in uh, the Spring Creek Trail when I was running on it. <laughs> it's easy. It's like I drip there, I drip there, I drip there. <laughs> Notice that there are no roots anymore. They came in with the, the pickaxe and got rid of them. Now, I apologize for this one. This one probably looks a lot better on your screen. Yeah. This is one of those ternary diagrams, but it's a double ternary diagram. And this gives you a small inkling as to how complex igneous rocks can be. So each of these is can be igneous rock. So you've got quartz, feldspars, and alkali feldspars. And I can't, I can't see it. Anyway, I just wanted to show you this to give you an idea of how complex the uh, Igneous rocks are. So when you walk into that person's um, uh, house that's just had that really beautiful remodel, you could always take this out of your wallet. <laughs> okay. okay, it's got, see, that's 22.4%. I think that's potassium salts where I am. And another 32%, those are quartz. Oh, look, there's an amphibole. Oh, wait a second, maybe that's a biotech. You can understand this. You can give it to me. <laughs> Next slide. Metamorphic rocks. Okay, so one of the ways you can tell a metamorphic rock from an igneous rock is the fact that metamorphic rocks are foliated, meaning that they, they're um, in stripes. So we go back to our friend's house, and this time it's quartz. I've got a quartz countertop. Is it natural quartz or is it man made quartz? It's natural quartz. Okay, so it's probably a nice. Nice is a highly foliated rock, and there's differentiation of the minerals. So you'll see, you'll very often see a lot of quartz in a in a in a, uh, a nice G N E I S S. And you'll see little layers of garnets or other feldspars or whatever that are going. And sometimes it'll go straight across. Sometimes it'll have little curves. If it was a granite. It would be amorphous. You wouldn't see any any kind of uh, change in the in the, the shape. No foliation. Um, so, so foliation is very important. It starts when rocks are first being metamorphosed. One of the really cool things is you go and you find a shale, and you look at the shale, and it's bedded, right? So you can see the layers. If you follow that shale to where it's buried deeply, it starts to become foliated. 
the exfoliation looks just like the bedding, except it can be at right angles to the bedding. So it's actually sort of um, uh, trying to fool you into thinking that that's the bedding. So I must be able to see the same rock over here because law of continuity of beds, if that's a bed, it should, should fall along here. But it's actually foliated and it can be truncated by faults or it can be folded back on itself and you could have the same rock only twice as thick as it was a little bit away. So it can be really da dangerous. Um, the other thing about metamorphism is you get segregation of minerals. So you start out with very fine grained or could be coarse grained minerals, but it's all the original composition. But as it gets more and more highly metamorphosed, it gets, gets pressed more, gets hotter, the, the elements within that rock are able to move through and creates what I was calling metasomatism, which is a solid state reaction where the minerals are changing due to the, to mo the motion of the, um, of the individual elements. And I almost became a metamorphic petrologist, but I got better. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. So imagine the Turner diagram, the one that was a diamond shape. Okay, so that's igneous rocks. If you do it with a metamorphic rock, you've got one, two, three, four, five different degrees of freedom. Add another 10 degrees of freedom to it, so you have to have two more of these that go into three space, so you can't draw it really well. And then you still have maybe four or five different minerals that you have to keep track of, and so you're doing, um, most simultaneous equations trying to get at it. It's just, it, it gets crazy. Okay, semi <laughs> classic versus carbonate. So I thought I'd put this in because we live in Texas and a lot of Texas has carbonate rocks at the surface. So carbonate rocks are rocks that are made out of calcium carbonate. Sometimes there's magnesium in it too. That's where it's called dolomite is the mineral that's magnesium uh, carbonate, magnesium calcium carbonate. There's actually a bunch of different ones. Those are the two most common um, and they're usually deposited in really fun places. That has absolutely nothing to do with why I wanted to study carpets. <laughs> but you can go to uh, uh, Dubai and other places in the Middle East, and you find these salt pans, which are called sapkas, and you get a lot of calcium carbonate that's formed there. You have these uh, little spheres that look like uh, fossils that are called uh, Oolites, oolids, and the oolids are formed by a little grain, maybe a little shell fragment or something, getting washed back and forth in a saturated solution of calcium carbonate, which is the very evaporitic ocean near Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Saudi Arabia, etc. So that's where you get sapkas. Reefs are formed um, on the leading edge of continents like uh, uh, the Great Barrier Reef or the, the reefs in Belize, they're, they're formed. And then we could talk about the uh, oil, the petroleum reasons for looking at that. We'll do that at some other time, perhaps. Um, so clastic rocks, a clast is a particle. So if I were to take this and look at it, it's really cool. This is from the Eel River Formation, the Eocene of California. And this material down here is called a conglomerate because the clasts are so big. And then you have this, it grades into a sandstone. So you can imagine this was on a river, not the Eel River, but a, a, an Eocene River. And um, there was a flood, and this gravel was formed in the bottom of the flood, was, was pushing or being pushed by the water. And then as the water slowed down as the velocity slowed, slowed down, so the rain stopped or whatever. The gravel got deposited, and then on top of it, the sand got deposited. And so we'll attempt to rock. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's a question for you. Which way is up? Um, what do you think, Matt? Maybe take a look at it. You can tell me which way you think it is. Normally, we have something called inverse grading. 
And so we have hyper hyper pick low. Doppler, Doppler effect. <laughs> So, I'm not going to say it until everybody has it. I love trains, by the way. It killed me just to stand, stand here and not go out and look at it. <laughs> Was it a UP engine? Was it a California Star? Uh, uh, Kansas City Southern? These are usually medium Pacific. Yeah, they're usually Norfolk Southern. <laughs> oh my goodness. We like trains too much now, I guess. <laughs> well, have you seen what is being transported out of here? If you see a white tanker car with a red center, it's hydrochloric acid. We're not talking stomach acid, we're talking like five molar hot ice. Oh, God. And, you know, they're talking about vinyl chloride. It's like 100 cars of vinyl chloride every day coming. Does everybody understand what they're doing with the vinyl chloride? PVC or PVC? Well, PVC is polyvinyl vinyl chloride. So they're, they're shipping it as vinyl chloride. And, that, and they're, um, the way they were trying to uh, keep it from exploding is they drill holes in those tankers and they let it spill out into the creek next to it. And so because the uh, polymerization is a very excellent thermal reaction, it gets very hot. And they were afraid that it was going to get hot in that tanker and explode. They didn't make things a lot worse. But they, they put a bunch of the vinyl chloride on the ground. And it, it eventually polymerizes. So it's, it's not that big. It's a carcinogen. Where did you collect this sample? Uh, Northern California. Northern California. That's, that's a great. Isn't it? Yes. I love that. That is a great. Yeah. That's great. That's going to be my gravestone. Small. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, a lot just, of story. There is. A lot of story in that. Yeah, I should probably start looking for my headstone. <laughs> you know, you might not see that when you use it. I might need it. <laughs> I'll do it now. I'm going to find out my address. You should tell me where you found it. I can go search out for my own. Exactly where are you? Give us yeah, a point. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a that's a good one. I mean, I have found a lot of conglomerates and breaches. And are you a geologist? I have an undergrad, and then I went into just the enough, environmental side. Just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> I know, just enough <laughs> to be a pain in the ass. No, 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 no. <laughs> caught myself. Okay, so. Um, Oh, well, before we leave this, Aaron, if I could interrupt you. No. If you could talk a little bit about something that's here. We have, if you dig down a little bit, you hit what we call iron ore clay. Uh -huh. It's clay, you know, but it's got the uh, chunks of iron ore in it, all pebbles. And it's I know all of us, if you've ever dug in your yard, you get down a little bit, and that's what you get. We call it road base. It turns to cement. But can you tell us a little bit about that? It's kind of a, a mixture. Well, that's curious. The pieces of iron ore, are they, they small and hard? They're about the size of a marble. Mm -hmm. you, can you, you can't crush them. They're hard, hard. Mm -hmm. So that's dirt type? which is a, an iron oxide, a hydrous iron oxide. And you could probably put it in a kiln and heat it up and get iron out of it. Get iron out. Well, they use it here. Uh, like when they built my house, they took some of it off and did the road base and dry the house. Well, that's interesting. It's very common here. And yes, when it gets dry and hard, it's just like cement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, there's two things that I would think about. One is that it is actually just precipitation of, of iron out of, out of the iron rich system. Because there's a red um, red clay that you find often. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty iron rich. Magnolia, right in the Good Lakes, just like five minutes on the road is nothing but iron. Oh. Okay, well, that's cool. Yeah, this whole area, you know, yes, I've, I've lived on various places. Yeah, here. so it is, I'm pretty sure it's dirt heavy. And sometimes, if you're lucky, you'll find some magnetite. There was a that's pseudomorphous after magnetite, meaning 
it looks like magnetite, but it's red. Does it look, you ever find little cubes or octahedrons? No. It's just basically, you know, this red, rich red dark clay well, I with the marble size iron ore in it. Oh, like the like yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. How's the dog? I'm sorry? How's the dog? The dog is doing much better. Okay. Was there any kind of vomiting involved? Oh, yeah. We, the we dog had, ate a pillow? Ate a pillow, but at the same time, she was having other issues, and we've discovered she has some liver issues. So it got complicated, but she's doing much better. Yeah, she ate for <laughs> For those of you who don't believe stuff like that, this is a real, an entire pillow. And um, I had a dog who ate a couch. And um, we're talking about stuffing everywhere, everything but the leaf springs pulled out of the center, like all the wood. Torn up. I mean, she ate the couch. This is the same dog. I walk into the um, into a room and she's lying down there, and she looks at me, starts thumping her head. I look down and there's a uh, uh, cord for an electric cord for a lamp, and she had chewed through it. Um, and I'm looking at that and I'm thinking it can't be live. It must be unplugged. So I <laughs> and it touched it. You know, flash. I'm looking at her. <laughs> I just call her dope. <laughs> okay, so I didn't give you a satisfactory answer, but you have my number. You know, <laughs> I'll bring you a chunk of it. That's your answer. I'm pretty sure it's Gary. I have actually I found um, beautiful mag magnetite or a pyrite yeah. octahedra that are pseudomorphous after Gary. Anyway, next slide. Oh, look, a prairie diagram. So this is the one that's important because we're going to be looking at this kind of stuff tomorrow. Um, so you've got the QFL or QFR um, diagram. And so you've got feldspars on one side, quartz on the other side, and lithic fragments. What is a lithic fragment? I got hundred dollars in my pocket for everybody to tell me what looking fragment is and it can't be bad. <laughs> yeah, so a lithic is a, a class that's made up of other rocks. So if I were to take my hammer, I didn't bring my hammer today. If I were to take my hammer to some like granite and break it into little pieces, that wouldn't be a lithic fragment. But if I were able to turn that into a rock again and then break it apart. That's lithics. This is that's what sort of it's saying. So you don't need to know any of this, but there are a bunch of different names for um, for different uh, rocks, for different classic rocks. If it's very quartz rich, it's called an aronite, a quartz aronite. And so quartz aronites are actually useful um, uh, commercially. Then we have an idea of what you'd use for the quartz aronite. So it's very rich in silver and, and quartz. There's a lot of things. It's a lot of things. Okay, name one. <laughs> silica chips. Silicon chips. Silicon chips. Oh, silicon chips. Yeah. Well, you could take it and, and um, reduce it really high and get rid of the oxygen and just have silicon. So we have silicon chips. That's one thing. Something that's a lot more common. Cosmetics. Cosmetics. Interesting. Well, I know in Iceland they have like the silica baths mm -hmm. where you can like rub silica and mud all over your skin and think it's an really exfoliant. So that's that's kind of interesting because that's actually the silica that you're doing that with is open. Oh. Unfortunately, they're little teeny tiny opals. They're not really worth much, but that's opal. It's uh, opal is quartz with a lot of water in it. It's very hydrous quartz. Um, Watches. <laughs> what part of the watch? Well, it's crystal. The, the little crystal part inside. Uh, uh, there you go. Glass. 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 Oh. It's very important here. Come on out. It has oh. to be of the right um, percentage of, of silica, otherwise it's not really useful. So, and when they when you make uh, windows or bottles or something like that. It's not 100% silica. It also has um, 
usually has some calcium in it, some other finer things to change the transparency <coughs> or the color. So if you look at glass, glass isn't all the same color. Sometimes you see it as kind of bluish or very clear or whitish. Anyway, so that's where you get your quartz aronites from. And they're um, uh, the St. Peter sandstone in Minnesota is a good example of that. Okay, next slide. Okay, I threw this in because I'm a paleontologist at heart. Um, so there's there's different kinds of, of fossils. We talked about this earlier. There are body fossils. This is a bunch of different trilobites from the fossil guy. There are trace fossils. So what is a trace fossil? We talked we talked a little bit about that, and I sent you out with that stuff. Are there any other trace fossils around? Oh, I was going to show you this really quick. Cool thing. Okay, we're going to back up just a second. Uh, we're going to back up a minute. I forgot about some stuff. Is this an igneous metamorphic or sedimentary rock? The answer is yes. <laughs> so what questions do you have to ask yourself? Oh, here's something else. If you find a rock on the ground and you don't know if it's igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic, there's a few things you want to look at. One is I told you about, can you see the individual grains? The other is, do the individual grains look like they've grown into each other? Is it, is it, or does it look like they got rounded and then stuck together afterwards? Another one is foliation. If you have foliation in it, you know, it's, it's a, um, probably a metamorphic rock. If it looks like foliation, it may actually be sedimentation, but it usually is. Um, the other thing is, let's see, here's a really cool rock. It needs metamorphic or sedimentary. So I'm of two minds right now. You know, what's your name? Funny? Yeah. Oh, I'm scared. Ooh, you're scared. <laughs> Catherine. Catherine. So I'm of two minds right now. Catherine takes a couple of my rocks, it'll make my bag a little bit lighter. <laughs> so I, I've had that for a long time, so I really need to worry about it. Anyway. Here's another really cool rock. I'm going to give this one over to Matt. Because I think you can make this. You already know. I think you can. You mess with those. Okay. 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 And we were talking about reefs. Reefs can be pretty much any size. The smallest reefs that you can find are things like this little guy. I found this little guy um, on High Island on the, on the beach, and it's full of little worm tubes. Those worms are called serpulins, fan worms, and it created a little tiny reef on top of a shell, on top of a, a, uh, uh, a, a muscle. Yeah. And here's one that's about twice as big, four times as big. So this is an ammonite, and the cool thing about this particular ammonite is these guys, you almost never find them completely intact because when they, when they got laid down, the sediment filled these chambers but didn't fill the other ones. So when it, um, when it got uh, very deep enough, they crushed. And so you never get them, you rarely get them all. I've got a couple that are almost there. And what's on top of them are the classic Ostria or oyster shells. And they're attached. So you can imagine this was sitting on the bottom of the ocean, and there was an oyster bank that formed as a result of these things. Pretty cool. Okay. So, one of the things, we didn't talk about pseudofossils, is that correct? Okay, so what is a pseudofossil? Looks like a fossil, but it's false. Yes. So you didn't realize this was going to be an English lecture. <laughs> Pseudo meaning false. 
Right. Um, so I've got the body fossil here, which are a bunch of different trial bites, and they look like orbition trial bites. Um, you've got trace fossils, which are little tracks, trails, um, exhumed nests, etc. And then you've got things that look like fossils but aren't. And you get a lot of people coming into your office when you're a grad student <laughs> or, or a young professor. And they say, I found a fossil. You go, great. Yes, this is a manganese dendron. This is what this is. <laughs> and they're beautiful. They have these little dendritic sort of branching patterns. And they're real pretty. Um, and they're made out of manganese. And they're purely inorganic. They're just a natural process. It goes, it goes that way. There Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. I think we got. Oh, just because I carried the diamond, I might as well show it. To you. So there's some fossilized footprints in a riverbed in San Antonio that would be a trace fossil. That would be a trace fossil. That's exactly what that is. So once again, the definition of fossil is anything that's dead and doesn't smell me. <laughs> so there's two things going on on this rock right here. One of which is that they're trace fossils. And those are little surface traces. These craters are eating along the surface. And the other is the water was flowing in a certain direction on this, and it created what are called tool marks. The tool marks happen when you get something, whether it's a piece of rock, or um, a stick, or some or a shell, or something like that, and it scrapes along the bottom of the ocean through the currents, and it, it forms these little rills. And those are could be probably thought of as a pseudofossil. They look like something that could be alive, but not. Mm. Like this could be a trace fossil right here. That shape formation right there. That's actually a, a, a shell. That's a body fossil. Mm -hmm. These are uh, so you need to tell people this end up. <laughs> okay, next slide. So Matt, what did you think of the uh, the cross beds? I can't remember where I found them. And this is just a preview of the next lecture. So you've got evaporation, trans transpiration, condensation, precipitation. And I put the base level in there because I love the base level. <laughs> Okay, so geomorphology. Tomorrow we're going to be doing some geomorphology. So have we figured out what kind of rock that is? It's pretty. It's very beautiful. I got that in Massachusetts near my brother-in-law's house. That was a nice line out there. Yeah, I should have taken a bigger piece. I had my car there. So. Oh, yeah, don't, don't ever go on a field or on a road trip with a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you know, how, you know, there's two kinds of people: those who categorize and those who don't. You know, one of them was a don't. Um, so there's two things that can happen when you're driving with a geologist. One is pull over. Yeah. <laughs> the other is oh crap, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've done both. <laughs> That's the cool thing about this part of Texas. I can drive 100 miles in any direction and not get worried about looking at elk. <laughs> oh, look at that. Trees. Oh, look. More trees. Wait a second. This is Texas. Where are all the cowboys? They're in the trees. OK, so uh, geomorphology, the study of physical surface features in relation to the underlying structures. So here's a question for you. If you look at Spring Creek, on on Google Maps, it's flowing pretty much west to east. 
Where is the ocean? Southeast. Why is it? Yeah. Why is it flowing west to east? We're not going to answer these questions. These are questions for tomorrow. Because it's running basically toward San Jacinto River, which is elevation, elevation down. So it's running. Down. Interesting. Screen stream capture. Um, Spring Creek gets a Copander Tom or Panther Creek into it. So it's actually about the same size as the same size. But I like I like the answer. So here's another one. If that's the case, why isn't the Brazos flowing into the same center vice versa? So I would assume it's falling down the some sort of uh, topo to go, make it go over there because mm -hmm. we have the Sabine, we have the Trinity, we have the San Jacinto, we have the Brazos. They're all running this way. Yep, they sure are. We're going to take a look at a, uh, a geologic map of the you know, you know, you know. We can get back, yes. It's well, in South America, it's some of the rivers run from south to north. Uh, well, there's rivers that flow into the Hudson Bay. There's the um, <laughs> On the north slope, it flows into the Arctic Ocean. It doesn't it's not? It's I'm asking where the, the base level is in relationship to the creek or the river. So all of the Trinity, the Colorado, the Brazos, um, there's one other as you had mentioned. Um, they're all flowing roughly north south because they're going towards the lowest place, which mm -hmm. is the, the Gulf of Mexico. Right. So. But I, the reason I'm saying this is I'm not trying not I'm not trying to be confrontational. I'm <laughs> talking about the fact that the study of physical surface features in relation to underlying structures. So we need to think about why Spring Creek is flowing east west and the San Jacinto is flowing north south. It isn't, but it's sort of is. And the Trinity, Trinity is a mess. <laughs> but we'll we'll clean up that super fun site eventually. So I'm just I'm I'm front end loaded. I'm going to be asking questions about this for a while, and I want you to to look at this and think about it. Because you guys might be doing a lecture up here on something, and someone's going to ask you a question. Remember, there are no stupid questions, only stupid people. <laughs> I'm kidding. There are stupid questions. No. <laughs> so anecdote number thirty. Um, I'm in a, a meeting with the, all the higher ups in the Gulf of Mexico in, uh, at Exxon, Exxon Mobil. And the VP of exploration gets up and says, Does anybody have any questions? There are no stupid questions. So I asked a question. I thought, I've been there about a year. But that. So I raised my hand and I said, The new operating system we've got for the computers takes about five minutes to load and five minutes to unload. So spending 10 minutes of my day, each day, every day, just sitting waiting for this thing to happen. And there's better software out there. And he says, I'm wrong. There are stupid questions. Oh. <laughs> Guess what? I never did again. <laughs> anyway, I got an anecdote for just about everything. So the penguin says, um, Okay, so Spring Creek, it's a meandering stream, so it is, I was being disingenuous, it doesn't actually flow these much, it flows like pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Right? Um, but you get formation of, of levees, and then you get formation of areas where sand is dumped into it in elliptical shapes, those are bars. Um, within the bars, you'll often find dunes and breakouts of the, of the creek. So tomorrow, because we have so much time, we're going to walk out to a really cool um, area on Spring Creek, and we're going to do a little bit of digging to see what we can find in the really cool. Mm -hmm. cooler than that. And that's where the evolution comes through. And a floodplain. What is a floodplain? Well, we're in a floodplain. Next slide. So this is a cross-section, A to B, of a, the, the, the idealized Spring Creek cross section. So on one side, 
on the side where the velocity of the creek is lowest, you get a point bar forming. So the point bar would form within here. So I didn't I didn't add it because I didn't have this the space for it. Um, and then in the creek at the area of highest velocity, it's called the thal wave. And then um, as you go across, you've got a levee. And the levee is formed when you have floods, and the it's the area where most of the sediment drop, just drops out. It creates a barrier, so it sort of reinforces the creek. And then um, very often you get an oxbow, which is a meander that's been truncated and left into a, a pond or a lake. So the two end members of stream flow are braided streams where you have a tremendous amount of sediment and it chokes things out and it keeps the um, creek or the river moving in, in pretty much in the same direction. If we look at the north slope of Alaska or New Zealand or Iceland or any of these places, look for creeks and rivers and they look a lot like this. Meandering streams are where you have very low um, uh, angle of, of transportation. Yeah. And, yeah. and so you start to get these, these very big uh, changes in direction of the stream. The whole thing is moving in one direction, but it, it takes its time. So there was a, um, a story about a guy who was, owned some land on the Mississippi, I think it was, and there was a very close pinch of the meanders. And his, um, you, you're, I'm trying to remember exactly how the, how the story went. It's not my anecdote, it's somebody else's anecdote. That's the problem. Um, anyway, so what the guy did was he cut trench through here and when the next time the river flooded it cut this off and made it an oxbow and somebody else had their plantation over here so he lost the ability to to get the river boats the river boats came straight through mm -hmm. so that was kind of neat so that's what happens naturally you get a flood this gets this is the highest velocity part of the river and it eats into it and then breaks through and then the creek is going to go straight through here and then it'll adjust other ways so when we're looking at this area, the Gulf Coast, there's a few different things we want to look at with respect to how these streams are formed. One of the ways is that you have underlying structures. And so um, you have things like normal faults. So we're looking at those normal faults. And there are giant faults that move back from the Gulf of Mexico all the way back through past Conroe and further. Yeah. And these are yeah. these are listed faults, and they create low areas that run roughly east-west. And that's why I was talking about Spring Creek and why it's going east-west. <clears throat> Is it possible that it's moving along one of these fault systems or, or being influenced by one of these fault systems? Mm. Um, the, the other thing, the other main thing that you find here are, are um, salt domes. So on Monday, instead of uh, doing what I was supposed to do, I went down to High Island for the first time. Mm -hmm. And as you're driving up to High Island, the first thing you see is this is flat as a pancake and goes right down to the, to the ocean, to the Gulf. Except there's this big bump. And the big bump is 25 feet off the, uh, 25 feet above, above the Gulf. The next thing you look at is there are the dinosaurs, pump jacks. Mm -hmm. The pump jacks are all lined around the edge of this <clears> thing. <throat> and the third thing that you see is if you go to um, High Island, one of the nature preserves, there's one that has a, um, a uh, walkway that's like 50 feet in the air. You look down at one of the creeks, and this is pretty much dead center on High Island, and there's a circle of plants that are growing in this pond. That circle is a ring fault on top of the High Island. So it's doing kind of both of what are the things I'm thinking about. One is you've got uplift, so the, the creek is not going to go directly to it, it's going to go around it. And there's even a, a big causeway there, a bridge that they built that goes around. Um, so these are the things that we need to think about 
tomorrow when you're looking at it, it's pretty great. If you're coming from Time Bath, about the time you get to Spring Creek, you can see on the other side, there's this huge elevation difference mm -hmm. between, you know, Tom Ball yeah. and Montgomery County. It's amazing how you can just see it. On 45, you feel, too, there's a few bumps, right, mm -hmm. where you drive over. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's, there's a bunch of those in the woodlands, too. Yeah. 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 On the, yeah, the farm to market roads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are things that you need to think about, the subtle variations in topography here. It's, you know, we're, this is really cool. This is, this is something that once you get this in your head, you go anywhere in the world and it's not going to be as, as difficult to figure out as this. So, so yeah, it's really cool. The next slide. Oh yeah, so this is just a, uh, an example from the Cretaceous, so maybe 130, 125, 130 million years old. Um, from South America, where you've got um, the ocean here, and then this braided stream system comes back over the top of it, and it floods back, and then it goes over the top of it again, and floods back into another delta system. And I'm just putting this in because it took me a long time to make. This is from work. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really cool. I think it's really cool. What do you think, Matt? Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. oh. yes. um, and it just shows you kind of how these things are forming. Um, and we can talk about what we see from a paleo perspective, paleo meaning old perspective. Um, I would like to go to where there's uh, erosion of Spring Creek and you get a, what's called a paleosol that's, that's uh, exposed. And if we, can, if we can figure it out, we'll do it. That's where that waterfall was. So you said yeah, it's that's not where that waterfall, yeah, it collapsed. Because it's, it's, it's off center. Yeah. And it's also, even if it wasn't, I'd have to go back in there and cut all the briars. We have that waterfalls in Huntsville. We get and bogs, big, you can swim in. Yes, you have to show me some. Very cool. That's, that's cool. OK, next slide. This is just Spring Creek. I just wanted to capture it so you've got this thing coming from here. And then you got it. it's coming around this way. So this is a point bar. And I think it's over here that there is a, um, a phenomenon called a crevasse splay, where as the water gets high enough, the creek takes over a different area, goes, goes that way. And it does it, it drops the sediment. So it stops the creek from going that direction, but it doesn't stop it from dropping the seven. And we'll go there and we'll maybe try something like that. And I think, next slide. Ah, Judge Map of Texas. Why is it look like that? So this is, this is, Young, younger and older. So it's going from young, <coughs> older to older to older. So does anybody know why it's like this? We should, we should be able to, on first principles, figure out what is, what's going on. Well, there's a couple of Mexicans here. Um, long superposition. We can talk about this much, but if we had. <coughs> So what's the danger of doing this in the wrong the wrong way? So you get I guess you have to be an artist too when you become a geologist <laughs> and learn how to did you, did you become an artist? I'm sorry. Did you become an artist? Did I? Yes. <laughs> like to work with wood. Well, maybe. Okay, so this is a subset of geology, stratigraphers tend to draw. Yes, stratigraphers tend to draw. 
Matt and I used to work together. I used to work with, I used to be uh, his wife's mentor. Poor Carl. <laughs> <laughs> so if we look at the, the pier, and this is south, and this is north, this is all dipping in this direction. So if you thought about it, this is what, what's going on here. So this is the youngest, older, 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 right? That makes sense? Mm. Hold it. Which way? The wiggling end down. That's south, okay? And that's yeah. north. That's better. <laughs> 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 you created a monster. <laughs> So you understand what, what I drew, right? And what's actually even more interesting is you've got things like this. What is that? Edwards Plateau. What is it? Edwards, Edwards Plateau. Plateau. Edwards, Edwards, Plateau. Edwards Plateau. That's not a plateau. It's, yeah. It's a It's a line of cliff. So believe it or not, about 120 years ago, 120. 120 million years ago, there was a volcano that reached the surface. It's like an island like Hawaii or one of those other islands in uh, just outside of Austin. Mm. So where is mm. Austin? Right around there. Right around there. Yeah. So it punched through, and you have reefs that are formed around it as it went around. There are other, there are a series of volcanoes that went up in this direction. And that was incipient separation of North America into separate continents. It never, it never happened. Yeah. Yes. It's almost done. It's almost done. Um, next slide. Oh, well, not so. Uh, we're, we're having a whole section on slides. Okay. So we don't have to talk about this. Okay. Next slide. But we do. Next slide. Next slide. You do need to talk about that. It's another turn we got. Oh. Ooh. 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 Okay, next slide. Ah, there we go. Mm. Land resource areas. Okay, so I have a question. The the slide that you showed that that I have the power. <laughs> I don't know map to Texas. Now do the the eco region, does the eco region map follow this pretty closely? Uh -huh. Because of the soils. Yes. They're involved with the geology. Yep. Get that. Amazing. <laughs> okay, so does anybody have any questions? I've got yeah. four minutes or three minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, I'm sorry, too late. You talked about the tectonic plates earlier. I saw the news the other day that Africa has like a massive. Is that a nice urge? Those tectonic plates are going away from each other, right? Yep. That's um, Lake Victoria. That's the uh, help me, help me. Drift Valley. Drift Valley. Yeah. Oh, that's where the gas comes out, right? It's like a, I just don't gas, but has, I think, made people sick there. Well, there are volcanoes that. That erupt periodically with CO2. Okay. And so um, it's actually lakes that have CO2 in the bottom that turn over mm -hmm. and yeah. kills entire villages. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they die in their sleep, so it's okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not okay. Okay, so so now I've armed you with a little bit of information. If this was a, a semester class, I taught semester geology classes, I talked to you about geologic hazards. And at the end of the class, I hope that you didn't buy on a floodplain <laughs> or uh, where there are mudslides mm -hmm. or volcanoes. <laughs> Hurricanes, that's next. That's the next lecture. <laughs> I don't talk about that. So are we ready to, does anyone have any more questions? Are we ready to take a break before we start weather? Okay, let's do 10 minute break. Well, then I'll go ahead and do that. Awesome. So... Um, I will tell you everything you need to know about Texas climate in the next hour and 45 minutes. Well, no, I'll tell you everything I can fit in 
in an hour and 45 minutes that's uh, worth talking about. And I'm going to cover um, five main topics. First off, the basics of the climate, why Texas has the climate it has. Um, the main reasons climate or weather conditions change from year to year, which is El Nino and La Nina. We've got um, climate change, which is why it changes from decade to decade. And the way all these things tend to matter is through the weather extremes. So I'll talk a bit about those. And I'll wrap up with a way you can do something about the weather, which is contributing to our uh, rainfall observing network. And as I go along, since I won't be able to see puzzled faces very well, just go ahead and shout out if you have a question or want me to explain something. Just interrupt me freely. Why are we talking about weather and climate in a master naturalist class? It's because weather and climate is critical to ecosystems. Uh, the amount of rainfall determines the amount of plant life that can grow, the amount of biomass, also affects stream flow and salinity of bays and estuaries. Uh, temperature, uh, both the high end and the low end matter, and the amount of sunlight we get, uh, of course, drives a lot of the uh, energy in the climate system and in the ecosystems. And it's not just the average conditions. We sometimes think of climate as being just what normally happens, but um, climate is basically the statistics of the weather. So it covers both the usual things and the unusual things. Uh, if you're a plant in Texas, you've got a lot of extremes, a lot of different aspects of climate that are going to determine where you can live. You have to be drought tolerant. We have fairly wide swings of rainfall from year to year. It's especially true in the western part of Texas, where it can change by a factor of three from one year to the next. You have to be heat tolerant. Just about everywhere in Texas gets hot at some point during the year. And uh, you have to be cold tolerant. Um, most years, that mainly is the northern part of Texas, but as we've seen recently, cold weather can happen throughout the state and have big impacts. Okay, the climate that we get is fundamentally determined by where we are on the Earth. And if the Earth were just a flat land mass, the only thing that would matter would be latitude, how far we are away from the equator. The equator and the tropics get a lot of direct sunlight. Uh, the farther north you go, you get less sunlight overall, and you also have changes in the length of the day. Uh, all the way up to the north or south pole, you've got six hour, or sorry, six month days and six month nights. Um, but the Earth is not a flat landmass. It's got water and it's got topography. And that's what makes the climate in a given location unique. So to explain our climate, we've got to look at what is unique about our location. First off, we've got mountains to our west. Uh, Rocky Mountains, the Mexican Cordillera, all of that basically blocks moisture coming in from the Pacific Ocean and blocks air coming from the Pacific. We can see air from the Pacific at high altitudes. Most of the cirrus we see is coming from far to the west over the Pacific. But um, it's a barrier to low-level moisture and low-level wind. So it's actually fairly rare that we'll have winds from the west. Typically, they're from the north or south and sometimes from the east where there's no barrier either. Um, so in that sense, our weather comes from the north and south also. To the south, we've got the Gulf of Mexico and beyond it, the Caribbean and the Atlantic Ocean. So that's our primary source of moisture. Um, that's where we get our uh, rainfall comes from. The water evaporates from the ocean and eventually makes its way into clouds and then falls as precipitation. The ocean's also a moderating influence. Ocean temperatures change very slowly from day to day and month to month. 
So if you're along the coast, you have a fairly consistent climate. The farther inland you go, the greater the amount of variability, both daytime to nighttime and winter to summer. The other direction from the north, that's where our cold air comes from. Uh, that's mainly during the winter time. We can get periods of time in the summer where the winds are just from the south every single day. Uh, but in the winter, it sort of alternates uh, between southerly winds and northerly winds. And basically, there's no barriers between us and the Arctic Circle. So we can get very cold air making it this far south. We zoom in a bit on the area around Texas. And uh, it's tempting to look at this and try to figure out where the Texas boundaries are. But uh, just sort of take a mental step back and look at what the main topographic features are in our area besides the coast and besides the mountains to the west, which does include parts of West Texas along Big Bend up to the Guadalupe Mountains. We've also got this general tendency for topography, the altitude to increase as you go toward the northwest. And there's some places where it increases more rapidly than others, such as uh, the area around San Antonio, the Balcones Escarpment, or the southern edge of the hill country. Uh, that's a that's a low-level barrier to air going from south to north that doesn't exist in East Texas, where slopes are much more gradual. Okay, with that setting, let's take a look at the climate, and we'll include Texas within the United States here, but we'll just focus on. Texas, and this is annual average rainfall. And you can see that most of the variation we see in the United States occurs in Texas also. West Texas average annual rainfall can be as low as eight inches in West Texas or as high as um, 60 inches in East Texas. And the variation is mainly from west to east. Uh, so, simple way to remember that, west is, is dry and east is wet. There are smaller scale variations in there, but that's basically the big picture. And that basically comes about from the fact that we have that barrier to the west. So, our moisture comes from the Gulf of Mexico. And usually, it'll be able to make it to east Texas, but the wind direction has to be just right for it to come into west Texas. So... That accounts for the variation both in Texas and uh, farther north all the way to the Canadian border. If we go through the annual cycle, we see, we'll see some interesting variations. First off, this looks about similar to the annual map, right? A little bit of a difference in angles and so forth, except instead of a factor of eight difference in rainfall from west to east, now we've got a factor of about 20 from less than half an inch in a typical January in West Texas to over five inches uh, in far eastern Texas. And that variation persists as we go forward month to month. As we get into April and May, precipitation amounts increase. So May and June are on average the wettest months of the year for Texas as a whole. Uh, we're May and April are sort of severe weather season. June, we can start getting some tropical disturbances, so you see an enhancement of precipitation along the coast. July is sort of a unique month in Texas. We've got that coastal influence, but we don't very, get very many tropical disturbances in July. It's more just sort of boring tropical weather that people go to the Caribbean for. And we, we also don't really have a west to east variation of rainfall. Um, it's fairly uniform all the way across the state once you get past the coastal areas, except for the higher altitudes show up because uh, they can be the focus of thunderstorms. And as far as that goes, in West Texas and um, New Mexico and Arizona, July is the wettest month of the year on average even though in, say, East Central Texas, it's on average the driest month of the year because those sea breeze thunderstorms don't tend to make it very far inland. 
as we go farther along, we get more and more influence from tropical storms, and we get sort of get our second secondary peak in rainfall in September and October. Comes about partly from hurricanes, but partly from the return of the jet stream, which has sort of been camped out over the northern United States in July and August. It finally starts affecting our weather in September and especially in October. So October can be the peak month for flooding because we've got weather disturbances in the jet stream that are that are causing upward motion. And the sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico have had all of summer to warm, and so they reached their peak in September. And so there's plenty of capacity for moisture in the air. And so those two factors can lead to the, some of the heaviest rainfall events we see in Texas. And you also, by the way, might notice the uh, in south central Texas, a little nose of higher precipitation that occurs in most months. And that's that Balcones escarpment I talked about where air moving from the Gulf of Mexico has to suddenly ascend and that can be a focus area of flooding as well. In fact, the the edge of the Balconius Escarpment, the edge of the hill country, has been called Flash Flood Alley for the combination of the meteorological geographic factor that favors heavy rain there in particular. Plus, you've got uh, sloping terrain surface, so water can run off and run off fairly quickly. And the soils tend to be shallow, which you may have heard about in the past talk which means there's not a lot of ability for the soil to take up moisture. Most of the rainfall is going to just run off. Whereas in eastern Texas, the piney woods are sort of defined by sandier soil, and so flash flooding is not as common because water is better able to soak in, even if it's raining fairly hard. Okay, for temperature... It's not an east-west thing. It's more of a north-south thing. This is January average um, daily minimum temperature, which in uh, the northern Texas panhandle is below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means a typical winter day will get below 20. Whereas you go down to the South Padre Island, typical day will get down to maybe the low 50s. So it's a fairly big difference. The experience of winter in North Texas is quite a bit different from the experience of winter in South Texas. Summertime, not a big difference. It's just plain hot everywhere. Uh, <laughs> the hottest the hottest parts are around Laredo, around Wichita Falls, or in the Midland area. If you want relief, the higher altitudes in far west Texas can provide that. Alternatively, along the coast, the temperatures don't get as hot because of the ocean's not as hot as the land surface is. On the other hand, if you're trying to escape the humidity, that won't do it for you. The average <laughs> dew point temperatures in all of southeast Texas are in the low 70s during July. Uh, the dry air is out there to the to the west and to the north. So that's a view of the average conditions. The, there's a lot that changes the averages from year to year. Um, I've listed uh, a few of these here, the things that cause change in climate. We've got El Nino and La Nina, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, there's other stuff going on in the oceans that sort of have a longer time scale that can basically give you like extended decades of frequent droughts or wet periods. Um, volcanic activity can affect the climate on a, on a year to year basis. If you got a big volcanic eruption that puts a lot of dust in the stratosphere or sulfate aerosols. Solar activities, the sun's fairly constant in its intensity, but it does vary a bit. And then you've got uh, other changes including what's in the air and where the Earth is relative to the sun, which is not a simple fixed orbit either. So there's a lot that makes the climate from year to year different, on top of the fact that the weather is just going to be different from year to year. You've got to, the, the weather is not determined by the climate. You've got 
specific sequence of other events that by virtue of a butterfly flapping its wings could have been completely different. So that's that's why I'm a meteorologist. It's so interesting. I can look at the window and find something new that I, that I haven't seen before. Okay, El Nino is a phenomenon in the tropical Pacific Ocean. Um, the main feature of it is unusually warm ocean temperatures near the surface. So here are six different El Nino years showing the um, how temperatures compared to normal out there along the equator. You're looking from South America across to <laughs> Australia and Asia. And um, it's getting you know up to three degrees Celsius or five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal, these super strong El Ninos. And that variation is mainly right there along the tropics from the dateline eastward. La Nina is the opposite of that, where temperatures are colder than normal. And again, you're seeing the most of the action is along the tropical ocean. It's it's a sort of a it's a sort of a weird system there where the ocean and the atmosphere sort of drive each other out of equilibrium. Uh, normally, we've got trade winds going across the Pacific Ocean from North and South America toward Asia, and those tend to drive the ocean currents um, westward also, and um, as that happens, cold water from below the ocean surface comes up to replace it. Um, well, if the winds weaken, there's not going to be as much cold water coming up, and so the ocean temperatures will be warmer. So variations in wind cause variations in ocean temperature. Meanwhile, the trade winds themselves are driven in part by the thunderstorm activity in the tropics, where all the hot air leads to low air pressure. And when the ocean temperatures cool off, you've got less thunderstorm activity and the air pressure is uh, pattern is different. So in a sense, the ocean temperatures are driving the winds and it ends up being this reinforcing cycle that can either make things warmer than normal or colder than normal for a few months to even a few years. Um, the only thing that really limits it is the fact that the the ocean has coastlines on either side, so cold water can only accumulate for so long before you sort of run out of cold water, and warm water will slosh back across from one side of the Pacific to the other. It's like a very slow motion bathtub. Now that matters for us through the thunderstorm stuff because the thunderstorms are affecting the wind patterns. Uh, the outflow from thunderstorms at high altitudes affect the jet stream patterns. And just, you know, just this plain variation of temperature, colder temperatures in the tropics means there's less of a temperature difference from the tropics and high latitudes. And it's that temperature difference that drives the jet stream and drives the weather. So we're sort of throwing the, throwing the normal climate system off in a slightly different direction with La Nina, the jet stream tends to be farther north, and with El Nino, it tends to be farther south. And since we're typically in the southern end of the jet stream in the first place, we get more uh, jet stream type weather during uh, El Nino and less of it during a La Nina. How that plays out in the winter time is with uh, El Nino tending to produce more rainfall. The map on the left shows that uh, precipitation is typically on the order of uh, the light green is about an inch above normal in many parts of Texas and just on average across the whole southern United States. So in that sense, the, uh, the first two letters of El Nino mean extra liquid for Texas. <laughs> and uh, other parts of the United States can sort of count on it. It's pretty rare that you'll actually have wet conditions simultaneously across all the southern United States during an El Nino year because the jet stream also has waves in it. So you tend to tend to have warm, wet on one side, dry on the other, and so forth. 
but it's not entirely predictable. This is showing the the frequency by which you get things being dramatically different, and it's really not much different from a flip of the coin. It's just that when we have a wet ear during a El Nino, it's typically quite wet. Temperatures are cooler during an El Nino, and that's a bit more predictable. Basically, with the jet stream farther south, the cold air is closest to us. Uh, with it being wetter than normal, we have more clouds. So both those factors are contributing to uh, El Nino winters typically being cooler ones. La Nina, just the opposite in the Pacific Ocean. It's colder than normal temperatures, and you might imagine that it leads to sort of the opposite effect for our weather, and that's absolutely correct. Precipitation tends to be below normal across the southern United States, which means that the law in La Nina means less agua. <laughs> and that is fairly predictable. Um, actually, if you, if you average things out over the whole cool season, all the way from November to March or April, uh, it tends to be a more consistent signal because any, any particular month can be quite a bit different from average. Um, but again, it's the southern United States being drier than normal and also uh, typically warmer than normal, although this basically says we're warmer than the rest of the United States, but odds are not especially high for that. And in fact, with temperatures typically colder than normal in the northern United States, that means that when we do get cold air during a La Nina year, it can be pretty cold and may not surprise you to learn, if you didn't know it already, that the last three La Nina winters are the last three winters. Uh, this one, one in 2022 and the one in 2021. We saw some extreme cold in all of those. Now for rainfall, it'd be nice to be able to predict what's happening in the summertime. But the problem is um, the, uh, the jet stream is too far north in the summertime to affect our weather. And so the fact that El Nino affects the jet stream doesn't really matter for us in the summertime. Uh, rainfall chances are pretty much a mixed bag. This has been just a noisy pattern. You don't expect to really be consistent. Um, some places, the odds increase for rainfall. Some places, they decrease. Uh, La Nina tends to be a little bit more of an indicator for dry conditions partly because um, with, with La Nina, um, we tend to have um, more thunderstorm activity over the water and less of it over land, as it turns out. Um, the most dramatic uh, summer in recent Texas history was the summer of 2011, which was a La Nina year. So it was dry during the winter and spring, and it turned out to be dry during the summer also, which really made for dry conditions. Uh, we were almost on that track last year until about August 10th when it started raining and it rained for a month, and that sort of broke the drought. But until that point, we were on the, just barely behind the pace of dry weather that we were on in 2011. Okay, so that's some of the variations in the weather we get. Let's take a look at some of the changes in the climate that we see. And over on the right, we'll start with that. That's a map of the long-term trends of temperature in Texas with, um, I think I need to expand these uh, text windows slightly to make them legible. But in any case, what you see is uh, temperatures are have been going up just about everywhere in the state. Well, not just about everywhere. Every single county has seen a, an increase of about uh, half a degree Fahrenheit per decade or more. And the um, there's, there's not a special tendency for it to be a higher increase in urban areas. Um, 
Permian Basin temperatures have gone up quite a bit, for example. Maybe there's a tendency for it to be increasing more rapidly toward the south and to the north. That's about as far as I'd be willing to go as far as a, trying to figure out some sort of systematic pattern. But uh, this is focused on since 1975. And the reason I'm focusing on since 1975 is on the left. Here we've got a graph of, in red of Texas temperatures uh, averaged over nine year periods. And they were going up slowly up until the 1950s or so. Then temperatures dropped and the, the 70s was about the coldest decade of the whole period. And then they increased since then at a fairly steady rate. And that increase actually sort of mirrors slightly faster than what's going on globally with the other lines being uh, observed global average temperatures, which are not as variable because you're averaging over the whole globe. And the smooth line is actually the average of a whole bunch of climate model simulations for temperature, which tracks with what actually happened fairly well. Now, we expect, just in general, that continents would warm faster than oceans, uh, because ocean, the surface of the ocean warms, that water can then sit, can potentially be sink and recirculated, and so you've always got this supply of almost unheated water that <clears throat> then reaches the surface and is affected by uh, what's happening in the atmosphere. But the land surface is stuck there. <clears throat> Plus, there's not as much, since there's not as much water on land, you don't get as much evaporation. And I'll explain why that matters in a couple of slides. Uh, anyhow, uh, overall, everything in Texas sort of matches what would happen globally, except for the period 1950s to 1970s. And if we look at the temperature on average, we see for maximum temperatures, they declined fairly substantially from the 1950s to 1970s. For minimum temperature, they didn't. They were fairly flat until the recent warming. So something different was happening with maximum temperatures than minimum temperatures. And if you look at temperature extremes, the hottest monthly temperature averaged over June through September, um, we're barely above the long-term average right now in that. Whereas those average temperatures that I showed you, those were you know, a couple degrees above the long-term average. And even the coldest temperature on record for each year is a couple degrees above the long-term average right now. So what's going on with that? Why are the summer high temperatures in particular uh, not especially warm compared to the rest of the of the past century whereas just about every other temperature metric we can look at is warmer by a couple degrees well to account for that that we have to understand what actually drives our daily variation of temperature in the first place uh, may seem kind of obvious that sun rises, temperatures go up, sun sets, temperatures go down, because after all the sun is shining, it's it's delivering energy. Well, that energy is not being delivered directly to the air. The the air does not absorb a whole lot of sunlight, um, which we know, you know, if we think about it we can see, we can look out and see things, which means light is making its way through the air without much problem. Uh, you wouldn't want to stare at the sun because most of the sun's light is making it all the way through the atmosphere and would get into your eyeball where it would get absorbed. And um, when it reaches the ground, a good fraction of it gets absorbed and some of it gets reflected out, but it's the ground or the plants covering the ground that warm up from the sunlight and that in turn is acts like a like a burner on a stove and it heats whatever is above it that's in contact with it in this case the bottom part of the atmosphere 
So it's a two-step process, or maybe even three steps. The sun's energy is absorbed by the ground or by plants. The ground and plants warm up, and the air above the ground warms up in re as it comes in contact with the ground or receives energy through infrared radiation from the ground. Now, let's get to the part of about why high temperatures may not have gone up much. Because when the sun's energy is absorbed, there's sort of three things that can happen. It could just plain heat up the ground, or it could, energy could be transferred into the atmosphere, or it could cause evaporation. And evaporation takes energy, and it takes energy that could otherwise go into causing higher temperatures. And the effect of, of moisture on, on temperatures can be quite dramatic. Here's a map of, well, these are actually a couple of satellite images um, from, as it turns out, um, Western Washington, because that's a, a good place to, to look at this. Um, the top is showing the amount of vegetation through a conventional index and you can see the center pivot irrigation areas these these dots uh green emojis as you will and over larger areas where there's where there's an orchard and in between that in the summertime there's not much rainfall and so you basically have dormant grasses same sort of picture you might have in texas in a dry summer but it's normal in the summer there in the middle, we got the Columbia River going through. That's colored blue, just to distinguish it. Now, on the bottom, seeing the same view, same day, except we're looking at the temperature of the land surface. So this is not the air temperature. This is the temperature of the land. We, you know, it's like the difference between um, how hot it is at face level in a parking lot and how hot the asphalt is. The asphalt or dry ground can get fairly hot. In this case, um, 48 Celsius is somewhere close to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And, but where it's irrigated, where there's plenty of vegetation drawing on moisture and able to transpire, uh, temperatures are quite a bit milder um, in the low to mid 20s Celsius, so in the, in the low 70s Fahrenheit. And you can see it's such a direct relationship there. If you've got healthy growing vegetation that has plenty of water, temperatures are quite a bit cooler. So this is not for certain. This is my personal opinion that basically what happened here to the extreme high temperatures from 50s to 70s is irrigation. We built a lot of reservoirs starting in the 1950s, and there's a lot more water on the surface of Texas to evaporate, and then we also increased the amount of water we were putting on plants in irrigated crops, which provided, again, more evaporation. So a greater fraction of the sun's energy in the 70s was going into evaporating water than it was in the 1950s. And that doesn't have any effect on cold temperatures, but it definitely affects the hot temperatures. Okay, um, I'm going to start getting into climate change here, but let's go ahead and take a pause and see if there are any questions about what I'm covering so far. Any questions? Nothing in the chat. No questions so far, John. All righty. So, fundamentally, the Earth is a, a, a ball drifting through a vacuum in space, which means that um, basically uh, there's only one way energy can get in and there's only one way energy can get out. And that's through, infra through electromagnetic radiation. Um, at some wavelengths, we call that light, and that's that's basically what's coming in from the sun. And 
Uh, any object that's above absolute zero is also is going to be emitting radiation at some wavelength. Uh, for typical temperatures on Earth, those turn out to be infrared wavelengths, which we can't see, um, but we can measure from satellite and so forth. And if there's a difference between what's coming in and what's going out, the, that means that the Earth is either gaining or losing energy. And if there's if it's gaining energy, then that means the the Earth system, the climate system, is becoming warmer. And if it's losing energy, that means the climate system is going to be becoming cooler. So um, that's the basics of of climate change in the sense of you could change the climate uh, globally if you somehow affect. Uh, how much energy is coming in and getting absorbed or how much energy is escaping back out to space through infrared radiation. And there are different ways of working out what's happened so far and why. I mean, so far, uh, the left bar shows we've seen about a degree Celsius of warming uh, globally over the past century or so. And you can, you can run climate models, which, as you saw, did do a pretty good job of reproducing what actually happened uh, with global temperatures and play around with them, basically, do experiments. You can say, well, okay, what would happen if we only allow the, say, greenhouse gases to change the way we observe them to? Or what would happen if we only allowed uh, air pollution to change the way we observe it to, and so forth. And so that's one way of of basically trying to figure out why temperatures have gone up by a degree. And if you do that, the the sum total of human influence ends up being basically on a par with what's actually happened. Um, and that comes about mainly through two competing effects. One of them is the greenhouse gases, um, which which have a role because they effectively reduce the amount of energy going out to space. They cause the atmosphere to intercept more of it, and what the atmosphere emits to space ends up being weaker than it would have been. Uh, the, the other competing effect is... Uh, lumped together here, it's going to be mainly actually things that reduce the amount of sunlight being absorbed through a variety of, of means. And this turns out to be particularly hard to measure, so this got a big error bar on it. And uh, as a result, we've sort of got a big error bar on the contribution to greenhouse gases, but the sum total is is fairly well constrained because the sun sun hasn't gotten dramatically hotter volcanoes haven't changed their you know, frequency of eruption much and over this long long haul the basically the el ninos and la ninas average out so the longer term stuff tends to require something driving a change okay that's one way of doing it the other way of doing it is basically uh, work through the basic physics of how energy is absorbed and emitted within the atmosphere itself. And that lets you actually do break things down quite finely into different contributions. So among the greenhouse gases, these first uh, four bars, uh, historically, um, carbon dioxide has been the biggest contributor to warmer temperatures with uh, methane, second warmest, and small contributions from others like nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, and so forth. Uh, on the cooling side, I, admit, I, I said it was air pollution. Well, the biggies are sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. So those are the sorts of things that are produced by coal-fired power plants. Um, and... They're basically tiny particles, sort of particles of sulfuric acid, uh, that block sunlight because they make the air hazier, and so there's less sunlight that reaches the ground. 
Um, plus, they also affect clouds because clouds, as you as you know, are composed of tiny water droplets or if they're really cold, tiny ice crystals. But water, you know, the, in gas form, water vapor, uh, really wants to condense onto something. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it takes a lot for it to form a droplet literally out of thin air. And so if you got more particles floating around in the air, there's more things for the water vapor to condense onto. And so, you know, think through the difference between, say, a clean environment and a dirty environment. Clean environment just has a few particles. Dirty environment has lots of particles. So in the clean environment, water vapor is going to condense onto a few particles and make them fairly large. Whereas in the dirty environment, there's lots of particles for water vapor to condense onto. So the same amount of water is distributed over lots more particles that are a lot smaller. Um, that matters for two important reasons. One is a cloud composed of lots of little droplets turns out to be a lot more reflective of sunlight. It's brighter. And so that reduces the amount of energy being absorbed from the sun if you've got clouds in a polluted environment. Secondly, how do clouds go away? Well, one way they can go away is through have the air sink and evaporate but mainly the way they go away is they turn into rain and the water falls out onto the ground and for that to happen you need big droplets that are big enough to fall out of the cloud and if you got a clean environment you're already making big droplets so those those clouds produce rain faster and they don't last as long whereas those clouds composed of lots of tiny droplets it takes a long time for the droplets to get big enough to start precipitating and falling out. So it's affecting not just the brightness of clouds, but also the longevity of clouds. And it's the same bottom line either way. Less, uh, more, more reflective clouds or longer listing clouds means less sunlight being absorbed. And that's really the part of this is actually the hardest thing for a computer model to deal with because it's all happening at this microscopic level and the climate models are trying to simulate things happening over the whole globe simultaneously. So um, we're, modelers are constantly improving different aspects of the climate models, including this one. And there's still, there's still a good bit of work to be done uh, before we actually can be confident about how different types of clouds are actually behaving and how they're being influenced. So the warming we've seen has been mainly human caused. If you're worrying about what's going to happen in the future, there's actually a bunch of questions to worry about. And the biggest ones probably are the first one, what will be in the atmosphere? And the one about how much will that affect the global climate system? And then the third one that I'll highlight is what are the local consequences? So we saw how important it is to know what will be in the atmosphere because most of the, the changes that have happened to the climate over the past hundred years have been due to changes in what's in the atmosphere. So to predict that, well, that's, you know, unfortunately for me, or maybe fortunately, that's not something that a climate scientist can do, uh, right? The, the large scale emission of carbon dioxide was driven by the industrial revolution. And if you're trying to find someone in the year 1700 to predict the industrial revolution, you probably wouldn't talk to a meteorologist. You talk to an engineer or something, or maybe you talk to an economist or maybe a social scientist. So, the question of that key question about the climate system, what's going to be in the atmosphere, is something that folks like me have to rely upon other experts. Um, now, to avoid really waiting on what the experts say or waiting for the experts to come to a consensus, which 
probably will never happen. Uh, <laughs> the modelers basically try to simulate the full range of possibilities or something close to that. So you might plug into a model a scenario whereby there's massive amounts of uh, carbon dioxide being emitted, um, going up from the current rate of about 40 uh, gigatons per year to uh, something over 120 by the end of the century. Um, of course, that assumes that we revert back to coal-fired power plants and really uh, don't make any gains in energy efficiencies. So maybe you try something where things go up only gradually. But what might happen in the future is continued efforts to reduce climate change. And if we are successful in limiting climate change to just one and a half degrees, well, what scenario would that be? That would be this one where by the year 2060, we're actually taking more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than we're putting into it, which would obviously be a very dramatic change. Um, a, a more moderate possibility would keep us below two degrees, and then this this one would probably get us around two and a half to three degrees. Um, but you know, who knows which of these will will pan out? In fact, these include not just you know not just saying okay, what's going to be the carbon dioxide emissions? How much economic activity is there? How much trade is there? How much how much innovation has there been? How how much uh, how much prosperity is there? And there's five different versions of how society evolves. And you can only get this much uh, emissions with one of those five scenarios, even if all you know, try ignoring climate change and all the others. Likewise, there's only one scenario that gets us down this low uh, if you maximize uh, climate action um, seems like something something in between here is, is going to be where we'll actually end up. And these are these are predictions not just for carbon dioxide but also methane, nitrous oxide, uh, air pollution. You know, is air pollution going down? That's a good thing. Um, of course, air pollution was counteracting global warming to some extent, so. It's a good thing for human health, but it probably means uh, an extra few tenths of a degree of warming as a consequence. And here are the consequences, at least in terms of global temperature. Uh, from the low end to the high end of those scenarios, it's basically a range of about a factor of three of how much warming we end up with. Um, compared to pre-industrial conditions. And most of that divergence takes place after about 2050 or so. So, you know, we're, we're fairly locked into a, a trajectory up until then, but you notice that these emission scenarios diverge immediately uh, after the present. And the lesson there is it's the actions that, that are taken now that determine to a large extent how these which which of these futures after 2050 we end up with? And just, there's at least one aspect of the climate system where even those decisions aren't going to make much difference, and that's sea level rise. Where basically, um, there's sea level rise is slow enough to respond to climate that we can't really turn it around in the foreseeable future, even. Even when we're removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, that scenario still has sea level rising at a fairly constant rate. Just because there's so much ice there, it takes a long time for for the the ice to melt and get things back into equilibrium with a warmer planet. So we can we can have a, a fairly big impact on most things in the future. We're still going to have a fairly small impact until the next century on sea level rise. Now, because of all that, it's kind of hard to say what's going to be the climate in 2050 or 2070 or 2100. Um, because, again, that's not really a climate question. It depends upon something that's outside of climate. So what we can do, 
I'm a lot more comfortable about talking about things this way is to talk about what will the consequences be of a certain amount of climate change, a certain amount of global warming. And you can do that because things basically scale. Uh, two degrees of warming gives you twice as much change as one degree of warming to a large extent. Here on the top, it's a comparison between historically what's been observed and what you get from climate models. And the patterns actually match pretty well. Uh, as I mentioned, land surfaces tend to warm up faster than ocean surfaces, both in the observations and the models. Uh, the Arctic tends to warm faster than mid-latitudes, both in the observations and the models. And that pattern persists as the Earth gets hotter and hotter. One and a half degrees of warming, two degrees of warming, four degrees of warming. Obviously, things get redder and redder on this uh, color scale. But you still got the Arctic warming faster than any place else and still got the continents warming faster than the oceans. So it does make sense to talk about uh, changes, say, per degree of warming or how big a change you get after a degree or two degrees. Same thing for rainfall, which is a lot more variable. We don't actually have good maps of rainfall 100 years ago, so I can't show you how well the models do. But this is what they do simulate. Increase of rainfall in most of the tropics. Um, of course, a dramatic percentage increase in the Sahara Desert doesn't really amount to much. But uh, drying in sort of the subtropics, especially the Mediterranean. And that same pattern shows up just with more intensity as you get to greater amounts of climate change. We I mean, notice Texas is sort of on the margin between uh, more rainfall to the north and less rainfall to the south. We'll dig into that in a little more detail in a moment. Um, on the bottom, we've got change in soil moisture. And the simplest way to think about the moisture in the soil, which obviously is actually more important than rainfall itself for plants, um, is it depends upon how much water goes in and how rapidly that water goes out again. And how much water goes in? Well, there's going to be winners and losers on that front. Um, overall, it turns out there's there's a slight increase uh, on average globally in rainfall. Uh, but the big change is in how much water goes out and how rapidly because higher temperatures mean greater rates of evaporation. And so uh, the patterns are similar, uh, but uh, they're drier in the soil moisture change than they are in the, in the precipitation change. So for example, uh, you know, from Texas south, uh, less precipitation, and sure enough, soil moisture decreases. But even north of there, across the Great Plains, we've got the projections of drier soil moisture uh, until you get far enough north that there was a large increase in rainfall. So um, this is this is how you can have more rainfall and have things be drier at the same time because uh, you're talking about what's happening in the atmosphere versus what's happening in the ground. And in the ground, it's not just the rain coming down, it's the water evaporating out. Okay, on to the extremes, the things that um, really tend to drive uh, changes in the weather. Um, the, uh, and this is a report that's available on our website. Um, uh, you'll, see the, you'll see the URL at the end of my talk. Um, and it's, it was uh, commissioned by a nonprofit that really wanted to me to avoid talking about computer models and wanted me to focus on observed trends. And I was able to get away with that because we were able to show that actually the observed trends are fairly consistent with the computer models. 
So, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, it doesn't really make much difference. So we can, we can, that for a scientist, you would say, well, you know, um, you want to, you want to see three good bits of information, three lines of evidence. Do you have a good historical trend? Um, do models predict a consistent future trend? And is there a sound physical understanding? And, uh, Fortunately, um, you know, the, they line up in many types of extreme weather. And so I was able to talk about things as though I was ignoring climate models, even though I was relying on them for consistency shake. And if they weren't consistent with the historic trend, I wouldn't put much weight in that trend continuing. So we saw versions of this graph before the average hottest temperature in the hot months of the year and the coldest temperature of the year um, i'll highlight um, a couple of of the extreme years 2011 is this dot up here mm -hmm. and 2021 is this dot down here mm -hmm. um now the difference between what i showed you earlier is i've expanded the scale the scale so that the the increment in temperature is the same in both of these plots. So these variations we're talking about in the summertime are you know, plus or minus five degrees, whereas the variation we're talking about in the wintertime are plus or minus 15 degrees. We've got a lot more variation in the climate in the winter than we do in the summer. And that comes down again to our summer weather is coming from the Gulf of Mexico, which is ocean. Whereas in the wintertime, it all depends on how much cold air we get from the north, from the continent. Um, but uh, yeah, it's probably a good thing that we don't have high temperatures in the summer ranging from 90 degrees to 120. So the give you an example of how this, how we break out how climate change can affect extreme weather. There's two basic ways. One is sort of a direct effect of temperatures. And I got two examples here. Warm air can hold more moisture and therefore we expect heavy rainfall to increase. That's a fairly direct physical statement. Um, another one example is Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the globe is. And so, uh, we expect that Texas winter cold ought to become milder as a result of that. So just looking at the direct effect of temperatures. Uh, the other way climate change can affect things is by changing weather patterns and the structure of weather systems themselves. And I'll give you two examples here again. Uh, we, we, we believe and there's evidence that the maximum intensity of hurricanes is increasing. And that means that some hurricanes, the strongest ones, will be able to produce heavy rain longer. And that's that's separate from the warm air holding more moisture argument because it involves the structure of hurricanes. And another example, Arctic sea ice loss is affecting the polar vortex, and that can lead to the weather patterns that produce cold weather in Texas becoming more common. Um, and you notice for my, for my rainfall example, both of those are pointing toward the same direction. Uh, in the Texas cold example, they're pointing in the opposite directions. Um, and at least from a, from a, you know, you can't make a physical argument to say this effect should be larger than this effect. Um, you know, okay, we get more frequent cold, but if it's milder cold, we won't hit the extremes. Or if it's frequent enough, we'll get super cold air more frequently than we used to. Those are both possible physically. So we can have more confidence scientifically about an increase of heavy rain than we can about a decrease of cold from just the physical basis. But let's look at what actually happened in February 2021. This is a plot of hourly temperatures averaged across Texas for the two-week period in the middle of February. And it was a warmer than normal winter, except for this uh, period here in the middle, where 
which uh, is why averages don't really tell the story very well. Um, 15th and 16th both got down below 10 degrees Fahrenheit on average across the state of Texas. And we stayed on average below freezing for basically seven days. Now, that's unusual. Uh, and it turned out to be, you know, sort of a, a odd quirk of fate that it was even more unusual than it should have been. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, here I've plotted um, the average minimum temperature for every day of the year in Texas from 1899 all the way through 2021. And there's not, it doesn't look like there's enough dots there to be every day of the year. And that's because of only plotting stuff below freezing when the average temperature in Texas is below freezing, or at least half the state of Texas is below freezing, which is only a few days of the year. And they're obviously in the winter time. So you can, you can count off the years and go to like tree rigs by looking at these vertical lines. But you can also see how cold it got. 1899 being this ridiculous cold snap where the average temperature of Texas was almost below zero. Uh, second coldest was back in December of 1989, got down below four degrees on average. And you can find 1930 and 1933 and so forth. And so so this this actually did manage to come in as the the fifth lowest average, fifth or sixth, low, well, sixth lowest average minimum temperature in Texas history, as far as we can tell. And I mentioned it was cold for two days. Well, for two days of cold, this is only exceeded by 1899. But, you know, it happens fairly rarely. His, the historical average would be like once every 25 years or so, something like that. Uh, but the thing I want to draw your attention to is uh, the this, this area here between 8 degrees and 16 degrees where that would happen about twice a decade until 1990 when it didn't happen at all for three, three decades until 2021 and that was, that was the same period of time when we basically had the transformation of the Texas power grid into a more isolated grid we had changes from coal-fired power plants to uh, natural gas power plants. And those created vulnerabilities in our power system, but they weren't well identified. People refer back to the 2011 cold snap in the report. That was nothing. That was a mild cold snap compared to what would normally happen every few years or so. So we didn't get those stress tests until suddenly 2021 came along we had one of the super cold events instead you know sort of like uh um if you if you go a long time without a hurricane you're less well prepared for a big hurricane than if you actually had a few moderate hurricanes in between so you had some sense of what the vulnerabilities are so uh and Climate climate change doesn't give you this. Uh, that's that's too dramatic an increase. The, the, as you saw from this graph, uh, the coldest temperature of the year has only gone up by about three degrees as, over over the whole um, century. It's not enough to explain that. And actually, having gotten colder in 2022, uh, it's not plotted on here, but that further indicates that we're sort of returned back to normal with these occasional uh, moderately cold years and we've got spoiled in these three decades. Okay, so the historic, the, in terms of whether the, the you know, got this argument back here, Texas winter should be getting milder or the weather patterns are becoming more common. Uh, it turns out, based on historical data, they're becoming milder. You know, despite, I mean, I guess 
you could argue they've gotten worse if you cover up nine tenths of this plot. <laughs> Just look at what happened over the past decade or two. But on a climate time scale, it's becoming milder. And um, we have a good physical understanding for why it ought to become milder. And I don't have a figure for it, but climate models project it to become milder. So um, that part, at least, is is um, so one aspect of extreme weather that is becoming less extreme. We also had a lot of snow in 2021 and i mentioned different different experience of 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 winter in different parts of the state this is the map of annual snowfall in inches um and you typically get about a foot of snow on average in the northern panhandle and i uh, typically get zero south of i-10 uh, but sometimes you get a big snow event that covers most of the state and there are four of those in Texas history. 1895, 1926, 1929, and 2021. So we got sort of the double whammy there of extreme cold and frozen rain and snow at the same time. Um, some of these others are worth commenting on. Let's see. So here, these are observations of 20 inches of snow south of Houston, uh, which of course means it can probably happen in, you know, north of Houston just as easily, especially when we look at this, 2029, these Texas one day snowfall record was set in Cleburne, Texas at 26 inches. Wow. So yeah, it snows a lot up in the panhandle, but they don't get much moisture, so it doesn't. They don't get the the super heavy snows. Uh, we have the capacity for heavy snow in East Texas, but it doesn't get cold enough frequently. So uh, it can happen, but it happens very rarely. I I would like to, you know, if if it wasn't going to cause so much human suffering, I would love to see what happens in Houston next time they get 20 inches of snow. <laughs> <laughs> all right now so and by the way snow should become less common going forward because temperatures warming up means you don't get conditions that support snow as frequently so it is actually entirely possible that in the next 500 years there won't be another 20 inch snowfall in houston but we'll get one somewhere in Central and South Texas, uh, they're not going to become impossible for a while. Okay, well, at the mile, at the high end, temperatures are going up. Uh, they've, for different regions of the state, they've basically doubled over the past few decades, and every indication is they're going to double again over the next few decades, which means, uh, you know, a, a, an average year in North Central Texas now sees over 20 triple digit days. A uh, long time ago it was around 10 and it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 or 50 by 2050 or 2060 or so. Now, there are some types of extreme weather that we can't say what's going to happen because we don't have a good historical record. Climate models can't simulate it. And it's sort of too complicated to make a straightforward physical argument. So uh, tornadoes is a good example of that. You know, we would love to be able to say what's going to happen to tornadoes. But just looking at this map of tornadoes sort of illustrates the problem. Uh, they tend to occur where people see them. Otherwise, they didn't happen. <laughs> So we got lots in Houston, we got lots in Dallas, Fort Worth, along I-35, uh, Corpus Christi area, Townsville. Um, not many trees out here, so they got a few, a decent amount here. It's a bit of a, it's actually a bit of a, um, science is turning toward the concept that what used to be, used to call Tornado Alley from North Texas up into Oklahoma and Kansas was more an aspect of being able to see the more tornadoes than there actually being more tornadoes. And we now think that it's just as 
just as frequent in tornadoes from East Texas across to Mississippi and Alabama. Um, so that the Southeast tornado alley sort of we're on the margin of that, just like we're on the margin of the, the Great Plains tornado alley. Um, let's see. I mentioned sea level rise as a as as something that's sort of inexorable. In in Texas, we've seen sea level rise and coastal subsidence in roughly equal amounts. So the boat, so half of what we've seen is due to climate change, and half is due to to local effects um, involving some combination of changes in in sediment delivery and pumping from of, of various liquids from the subsurface. Well, the consequence of that is the coastline is retreating. Um, coastline is dynamic. Barrier islands move around. They respond to the sea level uh, until you start putting hotels and buildings on them, at which point they sort of get stuck there and can then get overrun by sea level rise. So, uh, and it's possible for sea level to rise fast enough that um, the barrier islands can't migrate inland fast enough and you get a, get a new row of barrier islands forming. Um, we had, you know, fairly rapid sea level rise 10,000 years ago when we're coming out of the last ice age. And you can actually, geologists have actually, you know, looked at the, the patterns offshore and found submerged barrier islands from the, the last ice age. But the amount of migration we're seeing here is is on the order of uh, in places a dozen feet per year, although in some places it's faster than others because well Hurricane Ike <laughs> producing a massive retreat of the coastline in this part of the in this part of the state. Yeah. Okay, the last uh, climate extreme I want to talk about is related to drought and extreme rainfall, which is sort of two sides of the coin. This is the historic trend in rainfall for Texas, which uh, in West Texas is basically no change, maybe a little decrease. In Central and Eastern Texas, we're talking an increase of 1% to 2% per decade, which over a century is actually quite a bit, 10 or 20% increase of rainfall which is a lot you know that's the difference between a a normal year and a wet year or a dry year and a normal year so we've seen a big change um this is a version of the model projections for the annual mean precipitation change and um first off the 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 cross hatching represents uh places where at least a quarter of the climate models say it'll increase, and at least a quarter say it'll decrease. So, large difference of model opinion there. Can't really say what direction things will change in. And that's true along this hinge area between where it's definitely going to get drier and where it's definitely going to get wetter. Now, even that, that, the magnitude of this change is less than 1% per decade across Texas, which is smaller and in the opposite direction than what we've seen for the most part. So overall precipitation change looks like it's a, sort of a toss up. I can't say a whole lot about it. What I can say is that since we observe historically, rainfall averaged over a decade to vary by 20 to 30% from decade to decade, that natural variability is still going to be the king as far as our rainfall goes. There's going to be big swings from dry to wet, and it's not really going to be possible for a while to be able to tell whether there's any underlying long-term trend or change in the past trend, just because it's so variable anyway. Now, one aspect that does have a clear trend is extreme rainfall. This is a... This is a plot of uh, the trend in the heaviest amount of rain that you'd expect to ever see in one day in any given century. So the 100-year rainfall amount, you may have heard that term. 
and this is an analysis of of how much that estimate is changing over time uh, based on historical trends in extreme rainfall. And this is work that we did in our own office. We're getting, we're revising a paper on this, so it should be generally available in a few months or so. But anyhow, you see most of the dots are green, which means that more places are seeing a historical increase than a decrease. And if you average over the whole region to get try to get the full climate change signal, you get somewhere around 14% increase over the past 60 years in the intensity of extreme rainfall. So that's, that's a greater increase than we saw in Texas for average rainfall. And that's consistent with other places. It's consistent with climate models, and it's actually consistent with our physical understanding of how the atmosphere works. Because if you increase the uh, air temperature by a degree, you increase the amount of water it can hold by 7%. So that already gets you 7% increase per degree in how much rain you can get, uh, not even counting the changes in the intensity of storms themselves. So average rainfall, not clear what's going to happen, but extreme rainfall going up. And that is another factor affecting the soil moisture. Because, uh, you know, if you have rainfall that's not any greater overall, but it's happening in more concentrated bursts, then a greater fraction of it will run off, won't have time to soak into the soil. So, in fact, even if, even if rainfall increases, uh, we expect soil moisture to decrease across almost the entire United States uh, because actually less water making it into the ground and water getting out of the ground faster. The There's a slight moderating influence to that, and that's how plants respond to carbon dioxide itself. Right? Plants are transpiring through their stomata on their leaves, and it's a two-way street. They're losing water vapor, but they're gaining carbon dioxide. And that carbon then, through photosynthesis, becomes the building blocks for the plant material. If you've got more carbon dioxide in the air, it, you don't need to lose as much water vapor to get the carbon dioxide you need. It's almost like, you know, you're 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 in your hailing oxygen rich air, you don't have to breathe as hard. So that means that water as a result of that, plants become more efficient with water. They don't need as much water to grow. And you can sort of see that by comparing the left and right hand plots here. Uh, this is the the very top soil and this is deep soil. And deep soil moisture doesn't decrease as much. And the way deep soil moisture decreases is it gets drawn out of the soil system by the roots of plants. Whereas topsoil moisture can evaporate directly. So plants are, are, are helping to moderate this decline in soil moisture. And it also means that plants aren't as harmed by the decline in soil moisture as they might otherwise be. The, the fact that it's happening at the same time they're becoming more water use efficient means that they can handle some decline of soil moisture. And there's presently scientific debate over whether they'll be able to keep up with the soil moisture decline or whether in fact the environment is going to become more arid for them and we'll see a transition to more drought tolerant plants in the future. Now, the flip side for less water soaking in is more water running off. And here we're seeing, this is, this is surface runoff. This is the one to focus on. It's mostly green across Texas, which means the model average is for more runoff, more water in streams. Uh, there's a lot of cross hatching here. We're, we're, We've got to simulate several different physical processes before we get to the runoff part. And so it depends a lot on how the model is set up as to what sort of answer it gets. But at least there's a good reason to expect that we might see an increase in runoff. Now, 
The problem with that, I don't have a slide for this, is that if you look at the details of how that works, uh, what you see in the models that produce an increase of runoff is they have a decrease in the runoff during dry months. Um, they have an even larger decrease in the amount of runoff during normal months. And they have an increase of runoff in the very wet months. And it's those big runoff events that are driving the change in the average. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, that translates into stream flow becoming more erratic. Uh, where the base flow, the amount of water you can count on in a stream or in a river is going to decrease. But you'll occasionally get these flood flows that perhaps are even bigger than what they used to be, except in places where you've got reservoirs that are that are moderating flood intensity. So it, it really becomes a, a complicated situation for what's happening for repairing communities because of that. Now, this is an example of a flood in Fort Collins, Colorado, in 1997, so about 25 years ago. And over on the right, you see uh, some pictures of uh, a mobile home park floating away with, with a natural gas pipeline bursting and fire and so forth. And there were several people lost their lives with this, with this event. And... There was not a warning from the National Weather Service about a possible flood until the flood was already happening. And the main reason there wasn't a warning about it was because the radar was fairly far away and this was the rain gauge network. So they were getting reports of an inch of rain, two inches of rain, right? No big deal. Uh, after the fact, uh, they looked uh, they did a survey of, of various residents who happened to have rain gauges that they were, you know, for their own amusement, taking observations. And this was the pattern of rainfall. So it had over 10 inches of rain in the foothills that fit neatly in between the standard observations. So some of the folks at, uh, at the Colorado State Climate Office, that's where their, their state climatologists are located, uh, got the idea that we could actually, people would, might well want to have the data they collect be public and be usable for warning about flooding. So they developed a program which was originally called the Colorado Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. And uh, encourage people to get standard, simple rain gauges and report their rainfall every day and submit special reports that could go directly to the National Weather Service when there was some unusual amount of rain occurring. So um, 15 years later, there was a heavy rainfall event, not as bad as the other one, but you can see the change in the number of observations available. There was no way that uh, a heavy rain event like the one in 97 is going to fit, slip through the cracks of the observing network in that location anymore. So that now stands for Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network because other states realize, you know, this could be a good thing um and so it's it's really you know citizen science um at its most basic uh people who are actually you know would be inclined to do it anyway just taking doing doing it in a regular scientific manner taking observations once a day at a set, set time as much as possible uh inputting the data via cell phone or via computer and going into a standard network so one of the one of the original adopters was Texas, and um, what really kicked things off in Texas was this particular event. So the observations you see here uh, around New Braunfels are Cocoa Ra's observations, and 
0.012, and the observer reported in real time all but two hundreds fell between 3.30 and 5.30 p.m. And it was this little cell here in the radar that was doing it. And the Weather Service office in New Braunfels would not have had a clue that it was producing that much rain, except for an observer they trusted reporting it. And they were able to issue a flood warning for the areas downstream of that. And indeed, there was a, a minor flash flood as a result of that individual cell. So um, that's one application of this weather service and emergency management. Also for drought monitoring, it's extremely useful uh, for, for, for crop adjustment, um, farm service agency, for recreation purposes, for, for monitoring the, the environment, and uh, for uh, getting practice on how to take scientific data and, and uh, even analyze it. So here's the state of the network uh, as of the February 2021 event. Um, where it was particularly valuable for looking at what was happening with snow and freezing rain because uh, observers don't just report the, the numbers, um, a good fraction of them will also provide comments as to what was going on with it. You can measure snow and report snow separately from rain. And so that really helped us map out the snowfall pattern that we we saw in Texas in 2021, especially since the the official observers in some cases have basically forgotten about snow and didn't bother reporting the separate snow category. But uh, there's, there's plenty of training materials available for the volunteers and they were, they were up to the task. Um, so it's not a coincidence that there's a large concentration near New Braunfels. Um, not a coincidence that there tends to be more where there are more people, although not as, not as much as you'd expect from population because people in rural areas tend to be doing things that are more sensitive to the weather and so pay more attention to it. But uh, you can see there are uh, gaps in East Central Texas. And uh, it's particularly acute when you overlay the radar network because uh, this is a long distance from radar and it's a long distance from standard uh, observing stations. So observations in this area can, can really help fill in the gaps for both uh, warnings of flash flood or for, for other applications. Um, let me, um, well, let's see. The the website, um, I'll put that up again, is, is cocoraz.org. And I didn't mention one of the many uh, uses of it is actually getting uh, credit for the activity through the Texas Master Naturalist Program. So, uh, <laughs> and as it happens, I am the local coordinator for this eight county region, including Walker County. Folks at folks of the Weather Service in Houston, Galveston uh, are responsible for areas to the south, and Fort Worth is responsible for areas to the north. But uh, uh, I'll go ahead and stop sharing right now because I can just show you what the what the gauge looks like. Um, this is your standard 12-inch uh, rain gauge. Um, let's see, my filter is going to mess with me trying to show this, so let me see if I can adjust my filter. Okay, I'll turn off the filter so you can see the strange white blob in the background is actually my dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're oh. That's so cute! Oh. So to scale, this is one, <laughs> one small dog. <laughs> That's adorable. Uh, yeah. And um, it's consists of a cylinder. You've got it's four inches wide, which is a standard standard width. Uh, sorry, I'm working. <laughs> and the there's a funnel which feeds into the inner cylinder, which is gradated in hundreds of an inch. So when you're taking a measurement, take the top off and you can pull out the cylinder and read exactly how much precipitation has fallen to the nearest hundredth of an inch. 
anything that doesn't make it up to the hundredth of inch mark where you just got drops of water in the gauge but didn't accumulate, that counts as a trace. Now, in Texas, it's not unusual for us to get more than an inch of rain in in a day. And in fact, the gauge is designed for that because the funnel doesn't doesn't fit completely over the entrance of the cylinder so that when the cylinder overflows, it overflows into the larger gauge. Wow. So we actually have the capacity of about 11 inches in the entire gauge. And so you would measure it by taking out the, the cylinder, get an inch worth or maybe an inch and three hundredths and pour it out and then pour in another bit of rain and measure that and keep going until you run out of water. Um, under some circumstances, of course, you may get more than 11 inches in a day, in which case I'm really interested in it. Um, I study heavy <laughs> rain and I encourage you to, uh, if you see your gaze getting close to overflowing, to run out in the middle of the rainstorm, which uh, <laughs> at, least in, at least in Texas doesn't tend to be too cold at that time. It's raining that hard. It's fairly warm. And, and empty the gauge and, and figure out how much actually fell. During, during Hurricane Harvey, um, we had a, the highest report from a Kokoraz observer was 49 inches in, I think it was near Liberty, Texas, except it, it has an asterisk associated with it because the rain gauge uh, overflowed and he made an estimate from his neighbor, which had an electronic rain gauge. But one of the you know, advantages of the Kokoraz network is that it's a standard measurement system with known biases. A tipping bucket can underestimate heavy rainfall amounts, but this is going to capture everything that falls into it. And so, uh, you know, it's 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 only like uh, something like thirty bucks or so for the gauge, um, but we, it is required to be the sort of standard gauge so that we know exactly the characteristics of the measurements. And of course, you have to have a, an, an open area to be able to put this in so that the, the rainfall is not going to be blocked by trees or by a roof or it's not going to bounce off a fence or something. So ideally, it could be mounted on a post or a fence and stick up above the, the height of that so that it's not subject to water splashing into it. And of course, that makes it convenient if it's near eye level because then you can go out and measure it. And you don't, if you do this, you're not committing to taking observations every day. It's great if you do. Um, it's especially useful to report zero rainfall. Some people just don't bother and just only report rainfall when it happens, but then we don't know whether those other days it rained and they didn't take observations or they or it actually was zero. So actually saying it was zero is extremely useful. Um, and if you miss a day or two, that's not a problem because the water is not going to really evaporate because of the way this is designed. Uh, so you can report a multi-day total and say, this is how much rain there was over this many days, and it'll go into the record, and you can keep the continuous record going. So uh, in terms of you know being able to contribute to public safety, as well as improving your, 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 your scientific observation capabilities, this is, a, this is a great way of doing it. And also another part of it is something called condition monitoring reports where you can put into the record things like uh, uh, nearby stream is dry, normally it's running this time of year, or uh, the, the, the trees are leafing out on this date. And if you're keeping this up for a year or two, you can see how those things change in different years and relate that back to the observations you've made of the rainfall. So mm -hmm. it's a great way to, to keep an eye on the weather and and follow how things are affecting the environment around you. So I'm going to put my last slide back up here because it has like a contact information. And it also has my uh, summary of the, of the talk on it, which is um, the climate is almost never normal. <laughs> <laughs> it just keeps changing, changing for a variety of reasons. And it's always going to be interesting. Um, so got my website, got my email. You can follow up with any questions you have. 
social media. I got some students that are spinning that back up. But uh, that's it for my talk. I'll be happy to answer questions. We did have a question in the chat. Um, how how far in advance can you predict whether it's going to be an El Nino or La Nina year? Okay. Um, typically, around about June, we have a good idea of what's going to happen the following fall and winter. Uh, until then, there's a lot of ways the weather can affect how the conditions of the Pacific Ocean and the tropics are changing. But once we get past the spring, uh, things settle down, and generally it's possible to see what sort of trajectory we're on. So, uh, we, the time to start looking at the, you know, the 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 likely circumstances for hurricane season or for the next winter's weather is around the May and June time frame. Awesome. Does anyone else have questions for John? Yes. Where where can we get the rain gauges? Uh, the rain gauges are available through the Coco Ross. Oh. Now the the thirty dollar price is if you buy it in bulk. If I have twelve people interested in getting a range gauge, a rain gauge, I'll buy twelve, and because usually they're like forty dollars. Okay, and it's thirty five right now. It was thirty two for a while, so they must have gone up with the pandemic. But um, everything has gone up. So, um, but it's real easy to set them up, and it's very easy to read, even when you have a, a, a very very stormy day and it goes past an inch it's pretty fun so um and they, but they do ask that if you put in if you check it that you check it at the same time every day um it it says 7 a.m but it says but if that's not convenient or something like that you know so so if you do it at eight o'clock every day or at 10 o'clock every day it's still okay as long as it's at 24 hours okay i couldn't understand what was written up there is coco ross how do you spell that coco ross is c-o-c-o -C -O right r-a-h-s r-a-h mm -hmm. okay. um dot org, dot org. Okay. um John, some of your slides didn't show very well. We're using, uh, we're in a different facility than we usually are, and the projector didn't show a lot of color. So, but I recorded this, so it's going to have his slides. So you'll be able to go back and watch and see the, oh, see. the actual. Yes, you'll be able to see the oh. slides, and they'll be beautiful. Oh. Okay. <laughs> the only reason you couldn't see them here is because of this projector that we're using. Oh. I think the projector is older than me, and I'm in my 60s. So, <laughs> so oh, any, oh, good. Any other questions? Yes, so, Steve. If you go back 100 years, how temperature rain is being measured, and then fast forward to today. Mm -hmm. In theory, there's a lot more measuring stations and there's a lot more sophisticated measuring stations. Could that be impacting the data and the trends? Did you hear what he said, John? Yeah, I heard it. Yep. Um, the, there, there are a lot more stations and they're taking measurements in a lot of different ways, but most, most of the trends that I was showing was based on climate observations, which uh, the technology for that hasn't changed. It's, they, they have a 12 inch wide gauge rather than one inch, but it's still, it's still going out and measuring how much water accumulated. So precipitation trends are, are pretty reliable. That's not true necessarily in the Northern United States because of the way people have paid more or less attention to measuring snowfall, but since most Almost all of our precipitation is in rain. Those numbers are, are reliable. Uh, for temperatures, um, the technology has changed a bit, and there, um, there are changes of like a, you know, a few tenths of a degree between one type of measuring system and another type. Um, they they try to account for that by looking at when, say, there was a temperature jump at one station that didn't happen at surrounding stations. And if that's the case, they'll recalibrate the time series uh, with those. So that they try to correct for that. But even at that, the amount of, uh, 
of observed changes is is larger than the amount of corrections, so it still stands out either, whether you use the unadjusted data or the adjusted data. Awesome. Any other questions? No. Thank you so much for joining us today, John, and taking part of your, your Saturday to teach us all about weather. We really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.